Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm King Ao, Executive Director of the Financial Services Development Council. It is really my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon's conference on navigating the future of impact investing in Asia, co-hosted by the Global Impact Investing Network, or known as GENE, and the FSDC. We're really delighted to have with us today the Honorable Mr. Paul Chan, the Financial Secretary of the Hong Kong SAR, and Mr. Amit Bori, the CEO and co-founder of GENE. Together with our distinguished speakers, guests, partners, and friends, our conference program features an exceptional list of speakers who will share their insights on the current state of impact investing globally and in Asia. Their expertise will inspire and open our minds to new possibilities, I'm sure, helping us navigate the future of impact investing. Before we kickstart today's program, I would like to extend our gratitude to the co-organizer, the Global Impact Investing Network, for their tireless efforts in making this event possible. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Lawrence Lee, SC, the chairman of SBC, to deliver his opening remarks. Lawrence, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary, Ahmed, distinguished guests, on behalf of the Financial Services Development Council and our co-host, the Global Impact Investing Network, may I just call you Jin, a very warm welcome to all the leaders and experts in the audience in today's event, navigating the future of impact investing in Asia. I see quite a number of familiar faces and I'm looking forward to make new friends with the others. I often think the opening remark serves really one purpose. They say is to whet your appetite. I think let's get down to the bottom of things. After all, we are financiers. I'm to wake you up. I will try the best I can. Let me begin by the usual, the usual customary thing, by thanking the Honorable Mr. Paul Chen, the Financial Secretary of the HKSAR government for being with us today as our guest of honor. Today is a very special occasion. Not only do we gather to discuss an important topic and its potential to create positive change in the world, but this event, perhaps closer to our heart, is Jin's first impact investing conference in Asia, and coincidentally, the first ever conference that the FSDC is hosting in our 10-year history. So to this end, let me thank Jin for your trust in FSDC as your partner, and for choosing Hong Kong as your launch pad in Impact Investing Conference in Asia. Signifying the importance of our city as a hub for sustainable investment activities. Now, given so many firsts, let me switch gear and talk about why. Why impact investing? Why impact investing in Asia? And why bring this event to Hong Kong? 2022 is a landmark year for many of us, especially for impact investing. For the first time, impact assets under management crossed the US $1 trillion mark. According to Jin, to many, the rising prominence of impact investing in recent years may be a result of the pandemic. To me, I think truth be told, progress toward SDGs have been a bit uneven before the pandemic. And what has happened is a sharpened focus on generating more social impact and hoping to mobilize private capital resources to address challenges with measurable outcome. As impact investing merges into the mainstream, many major financial institutions, foundation fund managers, that is to say many of you, have recognized the commercial and social opportunities that impact investing offers. It is estimated that European market for investment made directly, directly into social purpose organizations and enterprises supporting social and environmental challenges now already stand at nearly 100 billion euros. 
while there is a growing climate need and growing client demand and fund sizes in impact investing, and given that Jin has been hosting a large-scale impact forum in different locations in different markets every year, that prompts us to ask this question. Why Asia? Why now? And why Hong Kong? In Asia, although impact investing may be said to be at a relatively new and nascent stage, it certainly has been around. In Hong Kong, for instance, kudos to the concerted efforts of regulators and the government, and may I add, civil society. More and more corporations and asset owners, as well as individuals, are devoting resources to incorporating sustainable practices and strategy into and their business framework, as well as investment portfolio. As awareness grows, many of these institutions and individuals in Asia are looking for more direct and more empowering avenues to make measurable social and environmental impact while generating a financial return. Pausing here, I actually quite like a slogan that the government had coined for a conference not so long ago, wealth for good. I think that very much encapsulates what we are here, both at this conference and what in our greater efforts are trying to do which is to recognize, as is in fact the DNA of Hong Kong, the power of private enterprise, the power of entrepreneurial spirits, and the power of markets, and add to it an additional task on top of just generating return, but generating it responsibly and generating it for the good of generations to come. The increased attention is shown to the size of investment investments, size of investments. The IFC, not Hong Kong, Hong Kong is of course an IFC, but here I'm referring to the International Finance Corporation, estimated that US $2.3 trillion has been invested under the mandate of achieving positive social impact in 2020, among which Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia, that is, are among the fastest growing regions for such investments, with a growth rate of 23%. While there is growing appetite for impact investment in the region, with that we see untapped opportunities. Perhaps I don't need to tell you more about that. After all, that must be the reason why you are here today. And through hosting this event, we hope to gather more like-minded friends, like yourselves, to fuel awareness and to share experiences so that everyone can realize the full potential of their investable capital with measurable impact. Today, we'll hear from many experts and practitioners in the field from different markets, different backgrounds on how to invest for impact. We also will have the opportunity to network and connect with each other. So that is to say, we will budget generously for tea time and breaks. And may I assure you that even though, like all conferences, we will overrun in speeches, and may I make a call to all the panelists, uh, that while everyone here would love to hear more from you, there is an equal important uh, opportunity uh, off stage at the breaks to network. So panelists, please hear this call. Uh, the breaks are as important as your sharing. And with that, let me say, I hope you will enjoy the afternoon. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to pass the floor to the Honorable Mr. Paul Chen to deliver his keynote speech. Mr. Secretary, please. Lawrence Amit, distinguished panelists, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to join you today for the International Conference on Impact Investing. My thanks to the organizers, the Financial Services Development Council, and the Global Impact Investing Network for putting a deserved spotlight on this very meaningful subject in Hong Kong. I am grateful to to the high-profile audience here today, all of you, 
more than 200 ESG specialists, asset owners, and managers, including family office principals, senior corporate executives, and wealth management professionals from Hong Kong, throughout the region, and around the world. Each of you, in your own distinct way, mobilize private capital to enterprises and projects determined to have a long-lasting benefit to the societies and the environment. Today's theme, Navigating the Future Impact Investing in Asia, is certainly timely. As alluded to by Lawrence earlier, the size of global investing market surpassed the one trillion US dollar mark last year. In fact, some 170 institutions from 39 economies have signed, have signed on to the impact principles, ensuring that impact considerations are integrated throughout the investment life cycle. The signatories, by the way, manage some 500 billion US dollar in impact assets. While Europe and US have inspired much of the early momentum, the promise is here in Asia. As the Asian economy continues to grow and thrive, governments in Asia have commonly placed SDGs high on their national agenda. Our nation, China, is an active participant in this respect. It is a major contributor to the world's poverty reduction. By having lifted close to 100 million poor rural residents out of poverty under the leadership of President Xi, it has also set out the 3060 zero carbon targets and is steadily focusing towards them. There exists a massive financing and investment need for sustainable projects in Asia. For instance, it has been estimated that the green financing needs in Asia alone would reach 66 trillion US dollar in the next three decades. In this respect, the region's fast creating wealth is very helpful in sponsoring the relevant investment desires. Against this backdrop, I'm confident that Hong Kong, one of the world's leading financial centers, has what it takes to help advance this good cause. Impact investing is very much attuned to the current investor appetite in Hong Kong. A survey conducted last year jointly by the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and an asset management firm, found that more than three quarters of those surveyed indicated willingness to invest in or pay attention to ESG products that have long-term positive impact. The availability of mission-driven capital is a key to impact investing. The presence of multinational companies, high net worth individuals, foundations, and the increasing number of family offices in Hong Kong presents a deep and variegated funding pool for impact investing to thrive. For some 2,600 companies of all sizes and backgrounds listed on our stock exchange, and in fact, the number is growing. Many of them are committed to building a sustainable future for the generations to come. They can utilize impact investing to achieve the relevant goals. Besides, Hong Kong's very vibrant private equity and venture capital sector has also become increasingly interested in meaningful investment undertakings. On the back of such demand, the Hong Kong SAR government is devoted 
to facilitating such activities and drive the market forward. For instance, the government's exchange fund has increasingly invested in ESG bonds, equities, and private equity market projects. The exchange fund has also set a target of net zero emissions by 2050 for its investment portfolio. Moreover, developing a vibrant green and sustainable finance ecosystem is high on our agenda. The Green and Sustainable Finance Course Agency Steering Group with members from the government and all financial regulators is consistently steering our financial sector towards carbon neutrality by 2050. It is committed to accelerating the growth of green and sustainable finance in Hong Kong. I trust quite a number of you are aware that we are Asia's premier green financing hub. Over 80 billion US dollar debts was issued or arranged in Hong Kong last year, representing a growth of over 40% compared to that a year before. Hong Kong has also had a burgeoning green tech industry. Our research and industrial synergies with the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area will fuel this development. In the budget this year, I have envisioned Hong Kong to become an international green tech and green finance center. And to boost such efforts, a green technology and finance development committee is being set up a range of industry representatives, scholars, experts, and business leaders will be gathered together to help the government forge an agenda, an action agenda. We will organize an International Green Tech Week later this year, bringing in the most advanced players in the industry to converge ideas, spark new ones, and foster greater cooperation and collaboration. Beyond investment, for those who are wishing to make a difference full philanthropy, Hong Kong is also an ideal destination. We have a deep culture of giving, demonstrated by individual charitable donations reaching one billion US dollar a year. In fact, there are nearly 10,000 charitable organizations in Hong Kong. We are keen on emerging as a philanthropic center where we help philanthropists to use their charitable capital to benefit those in need around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, to realize the potential embedded in our fast reach in our far-reaching initiatives and goals, we need to ensure a continuing, continuing supply of talents, of world-class standard, and we are working very hard towards that ambition. Since December last year, we rolled out a new talent admission scheme and upgraded the other three talent schemes as well. The response so far has been overwhelming. By the middle of April, we have already received over 60,000 applications and have approved more than half of them. And these people are coming. For ESG talent aspiring to take their career to Hong Kong, including those of you who are in the audience, you are on our talent list. That means we want you. And indeed, a new and expanded talent list will be published soon to attract more types of talents to come to Hong Kong. And for friends from abroad, we welcome you to be a part of us. And I hope I will see many of you making an impact not just on finance, but in many other areas in the not too distant future. My sincere thanks 
once again to the FSDC and JIN for organizing this groundbreaking international gathering here in Hong Kong. And my sincere thanks also to the Council for its commitment to green and sustainable development. The, SF, the FSDC has produced many policy papers and research publications on this very interesting topic, including market prospects and enhancement of our human capital. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a rewarding afternoon and a future blessed with impact investing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your enlightening speech. Right, uh, while my colleagues are setting the stage, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Amit Bori, the CEO and co-founder of Gene. Since its inception in 2009, Gene has built the largest global impact investing industry network of over 20,000 investors and leaders. Amit is going to share with us his thoughts on activating capital for a better world and exploration of impact investing and the SDGs. Please join me in welcoming Amit. Please. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm so grateful and we're so honored to be here and want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, I want to begin by expressing my appreciation um, for a few people who have helped to uh, make this event possible. Um, first, um, our gratitude to the Honorable Paul Chan, Financial Secretary of the Government of Hong Kong SAR, to Lawrence Lee, Chairman of the FSDC, to all of our esteemed speakers who are making this event possible, and to the FSDC team, including Daniel Fung, King Ao, Rocky Tung, uh, Joyce Lee, Jessica Tang, um, and of course, uh, to my colleagues at the Jin um, who've helped to organize this program, um, and last but not least, um, all of you, uh, our members, our partners, uh, our friends, um, and our collaborators in helping to bring impact investing to its full potential in Asia. So I, I'll be speaking about how we can activate capital for a better world. Uh, but first, I want to start with what brings us all here together today. We're here to embrace a few ideas. First, a recognition that inequality and wealth gaps exist all around the world. The condition of our planet cannot be ignored. But also that capital can be a force for progress. And the discussion today will center on how we can harness the power um, of our collective capital um, to realize progress that the world so desperately needs. Now, I'll be speaking about the Sustainable Development Goals, which I think most of you are familiar with, but they were um, formed in 2015 uh, by the United Nations to give a global framework for the progress that was needed to be made by 2030. Uh, it's a comprehensive view at a systemic approach to sustainable development, ranging from ending poverty, taking action for the climate, um, protecting nature, um, and realizing important um, issues around equity. Now, one of the things that's been so exciting is that the private sector has embraced the SDGs in, in many ways. And we've seen no shortage of big commitments to how um, uh, investors and companies are committing resources to the achievement of the SDGs. But if you were to just look at these headlines, you might um, uh, conclude that this is actually that we've achieved what we need to, um, that we've actually realized the progress and the potential that we were aiming for. Um, but of course, as we all know, there still remains a large financing gap. The world continues to fall short of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we also continue to fall short of what we need to head off climate change. And this is what brings us here today, um, is the role that we can play with, um, in addressing this gap through impact investments. Oh, excuse me. Now, just to define impact investments, to be um, explicit about what we are speaking about. Impact investments are investments made with the intention to generate positive, measurable, social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. They can occur all around the world, across many themes, uh, across many different asset classes. 
but what you, you connects them is that there's a, a, a dual objective, both the achievement of financial return as well as the achievement of impact for people and for the planet. Now, as you heard um, Secretary Chan, um, as well as Chairman Lee refer to, um, our latest market size puts the global impact investing market at $1.164 trillion US. Now, as you can see, this is a snapshot of where the market is today. Um, and the market is much larger in, in North America and in Europe. But of course, what we're here to discuss is where the market could go. Um, and, and we think Asia is going to be critical to the um, achievement of the sustainable development goals, and also critical to the future um, uh, growth of the impact investing market. And that's why this event and this gathering are so important, and we're so grateful to have you all here with us. You know, the way we think about impact investments is that there's a few core characteristics, four in particular, that the investments are made with intentionality, that they use evidence and impact data, uh, that investors manage impact performance, and that investors are, are contributing to the growth of the industry through partnering with organizations like us and through collaborating with other impact investors. We see impact investments um, made by all different types of institutions. Uh, asset managers, asset owners, uh, foundations, um, large institutional investors, uh, development finance institutions, family offices, uh, and beyond. We also see that impact investments are occurring across asset classes. Um, so our current estimate is that um, private debt and, and public equity are the largest sectors, um, but you see that it's actually quite close, uh, closely spread across private equity, real assets, and publicly traded debt. This is incredibly important because you can think about impact investing in a diversified way. Um, so if you're managing uh, an, um, you know, a pool of assets, think, seeking diversification, you can think about how impact investments uh, can be placed through different parts of your portfolio. We also see that impact investors very consistently are realizing their impact objectives and their financial objectives. The vast majority um, are meeting or exceeding um, their financial expectations, uh, and an even greater majority are meeting or exceeding their impact expectations. One of the things that's so important is that um, you can think about how to activate different types of assets for impact investing. And we wanted to highlight that there's a role to play for all different types of institutions. Institutional investors, whether they be um, uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, um, or even uh, um, endowments, family offices, of course, asset managers, large and small, um, some of the world's largest asset managers, all the way down to boutiques, completely specialized impact investing, uh, philanthropic foundations, think about how to use their financial resources, and increasingly we're seeing companies think about their treasury assets and how to activate those um, financial resources to achieve their broader commitments to purpose and sustainability. Now I want to spend a few moments about how we can help support you for those of you who are interested in impact investing. Um, we do have a, a membership network that includes over 400 organizations in 55 countries around the world. Um, it includes asset owners, asset managers, as well as service providers. Um, and we see that it's um, spread around the world. And of course, there's a um, significant portion from Asia, and that's one of the areas that we, we hope to grow. In addition to the membership, we also provide a lot of resources for how you can measure and manage your impact. The system Iris Plus is used by over 35,000 people around the world. Um, it's a freely available system that you can access to help build a framework for how you measure your impact, to help highlight your approach, um, and a new area for us is that we're developing um, you know, analytics, benchmarks for impact performance through a new initiative called the GN Impact Lab. Um, there are many uh, uh, organizations uh, that you will know very well. I think we currently have over 19,000 firms that are using Iris Plus, including those listed here. Um, you know, large scale asset managers and asset owners um, you know, based in Asia, Australia, Europe, the US and beyond. We also want to highlight um, uh, what you heard um, Chairman Lee refer to as our, our global um, impact forum. Uh, so the GIN Impact Forum is going to be held this year um, in October, on the 4th and 5th to be precise, in Copenhagen. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about impact investing and connecting to the global community, we hope you all can join us. 
And last but not least, I want to highlight a couple of the other ways in which you can um, you know, uh, get involved with our work and resources that we have that can help support you in your journey. The operating principles for impact management, referred to by Secretary Chan, um, is a way that you can actually commit to embedding impact practices in your approach. The Impact Lab, which I mentioned briefly, we're building impact um, performance benchmarks. Um, and then uh, we'll be developing further analytics in areas like financial inclusion, agriculture, and clean energy. And um, then we continue to con conduct research on the market. Um, so please you know, uh, check out our website if you want more information that could help you get up to speed on what's happening in impact investing all around the world. Um, and I'll close with just expressing my appreciation um, for this event. Um, we're so honored to be here in Hong Kong and so honored to have all of you join us. Um, but we hope this is the beginning of our relationship um, and that you all take advantage of the many resources we offer and join us in this effort um, to realize the full potential of impact investing in Asia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amit, for your insightful sharing. Indeed, to drive for a sustainable world, the key would be to identify effective ways to educate investors mobilize capital, and accelerate impact investing. Building on this topic, I'm pleased to invite our next guest speaker, Christine Nuni from the Ford Foundation, where she is the Deputy Director for Mission Investments. Christine's talk on the trillion dollar opportunity, impact investing's rise to prominence, will be moderated by uh, Ms. Naoko Kumara, Director for Membership Growth and Global Operations at the GENE. Please join me in welcoming Christine and Naoko at this stage. Hello. Hello? Okay. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Well, it's lovely to be here with you, Christine. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'd love to be talking to you about uh, the opportunity uh, globally, but also in Asia. Uh, but I thought as an introduction, um, if you could first start by speaking about the Ford Foundation, and you've had an illustrious career there for almost 20 years now, I believe. So if you could tell us a little bit about your role. Great, well, I'm so happy to be here. And let me start maybe with a couple of points. First is to express my gratitude to the financial secretary, to the GIN and FSDC for hosting this inaugural event. Um, second, I'm going to apologize for my footwear. I had an accident with my foot, so I had plans for other shoe wear today, but we're gonna have to go with the sneakers. Um, and lastly, I, I, this is called the trillion dollar opportunity this session. And I just say, as someone who's been allocating capital for impact for the last 20 years. I just wanted to express both my optimism and conviction that we're really at just the beginning. Um, the Ford Foundation is a global philanthropy. We're headquartered in the United States, but we have offices in 10 regions around the world, including three in Asia, one in China, one in Indonesia, and one in India. And the foundation is focusing all of its resources on one very large and ambitious goal, which is around reducing inequality in all of its forms. We do this through grant making, but we also have deep conviction in the role investment capital can play. And we, we do this through three sources of capital, which I think are important pools of capital that philanthropies should consider in terms of their ability to engage in the impact investing market. We support grant making to support the infrastructure for impact investing so that it can continue to grow and grow with integrity. And that includes supporting groups like the GIN, um, as well as um, organizations advocating around policy and, and regulations to unlock more capital for good, and continuing to support the um, development of impact measurement and management practices for the market. And then we have two investment pools that we invest through. One is a long-standing fund that we use to catalyze new opportunities, new teams, new ideas, where we take outsized risk to really bet on innovation for the market and to catalyze new opportunities. 
The second is a billion dollar allocation from our endowment that we launched six years ago. And that pool of capital is used with the intention to both generate strong risk adjusted financial returns, as well as impact outcomes that align with the foundation's mission. Um, we have a number of thematic strategies that we believe that we can deliver on both of those objectives. Um, they include themes like the preservation and development of affordable housing, advancing financial inclusion, supporting global health, supporting diversity in asset management, and supporting job quality improvement for workers. Um, we invest largely through investment managers and largely in private markets. Um, and I will pause there and, and turn it back. Thank you so much. And you mentioned this $1 billion commitment. Um, this was an announcement made, made in 2017. I believe it was the largest commitment at the time made by any foundation endowment. But can you tell us about the significance of this commitment and how, as the Ford Foundation, uh, you came to that decision? Sure. Um, the Ford Foundation's endowment, which today is about $16 billion, up until 2017 was managed quite traditionally. Um, we invested across asset classes with one goal in mind, which was to deliver strong financial returns to support our grant making and operations. And as a private foundation in the US, we're required to give away 5% of our assets each year in charitable giving. And so each year we try to generate a return of 5% plus inflation, which in today's environment is, is a big number. Um, and, and that had been the way we managed that endowment um, up until 2017. And the ask in front of our board was to say, could we do more with the other 95%? This 5% is going for our charitable giving and is aligned with our mission, but is there an opportunity to use more of our endowment to align with our mission? And the board, maybe unlike um, people in this room, initially approached this ask with some healthy skepticism. I think they, they questioned a couple of things. One was, was, was the opportunity really there? Were there enough investment opportunities that could generate these double bottom line objectives in, in operation in the market? Um, and then the second was, could we really generate the types of financial returns we need to to support an endowment in perpetuity? And then the third, not surprisingly, was could we have the kind of impact that they'd really want to see out of a portfolio like this? I think what ultimately got them comfortable were, were three things. One big picture was the opportunity to put more of our assets behind our mission. Uh, it's, it's very, I think, compelling opportunity for foundations, asset managers, asset owners around the world. Um, and for the Ford Foundation, we see it as an incredible innovation and opportunity for philanthropy. Um, but secondly, were the trends we were seeing at the time, which only have kind of continued to, to grow over the last uh, six or seven years. And they included things like the surge of talent we were seeing come into this market the number of, of fund managers we could point to and really talk about the performance that they were achieving, both from a financial and impact perspective. The infrastructure, thanks to groups like the gym that was being developed, supporting ecosystem, a really supportive um, policy and regulatory environment in the United States at the time um, to enable us to do this. And then I think our own conviction that we were just at the beginning and that this was gonna to continue to grow and that we could make an argument that a billion dollars could be allocated over time. I'd say the third thing that got our board comfortable was the fact that we paced this out. So they approved a billion dollar allocation, but they approved it to be invested over a 10 year period. So we're about six years in, um, but I think that pacing gave them comfort that we could kind of see proof points along the way um, and, and monitor the market's growth. Thank you. So you're now six years in to, the, uh, to managing this mission, uh, missions investment portfolio. Uh, but I'm sure you have plenty of learnings. Uh, but curious to know, um, was there a moment when you realized that there is this tremendous opportunity and what that might have felt like? I feel like there have been so many of those moments. Uh, probably some of the first for me was about five, five years into doing this work when 
I was just seeing the proof points and in individual investments. Um, and I think for me, that was really eye-opening. Um, but over the last kind of six years, there have been a couple. Um, I think part of it is our own just track record that we've developed now investing over the last six years. We publicly issued the results of our performance for the first five years. Um, our financial returns were 20% and above, and we were generating some really, really strong and compelling mission outcomes, um, really showing solutions to some of the social problems we were trying to address with our capital. So I think from a, a proof point and excitement, that was, that was definitely one. I think the second is just the continued influx of, of opportunity. And last year alone, we saw over, we reviewed over 500 opportunities and, and they were all compelling. And I think the hardest part sometimes about my job is, is the amount of no's I have to say um, to just from an investment selection process, finding the one or two we can do each year. And then the third is just from the supply of capital and Amit showed it on the screen but some of the big asset managers that he, he showed up there, like BlackRock, like Goldman Sachs, these managers are not just committing like billion, they are committing billions of dollars towards this, which are small relative to their own assets under management, but they, I think, reflect just the huge opportunity that's in front of us and the demand they're getting from their clients to put these products in the market and their ability to, you know, to deliver on them. And just add a little bit more color to what you've been doing for the, six, for the past six years now. Can you share maybe one or two examples of investments that you think highlight this opportunity? Sure. Um, maybe, maybe I'll pick two. So we, we invest in affordable housing, and then we also invest in financial inclusion. And I think both sectors are good examples of the just incredible growth I've seen. We started investing in affordable housing in the United States in, in the late 60s, mostly with grants and then through some of our catalytic capital investments. And at the time, there were no funds to invest in. Um, but when we started um, investing out of this billion dollar allocation, um, affordable housing was one of our strategies. There were maybe five or six managers in the market and the offerings they were putting forward were in the 200, 300 million dollar range, which, which is sizable. But what's incredible is that in the last six years, those same managers are now offering one and a half billion dollar funds. And, and they're able to do that for a couple of reasons. One, they've been able to demonstrate that they can effectively allocate capital, generate the returns, and generate the social outcomes. But secondly, there's huge demand for this. There's a massive affordable housing crisis, and this is one of those unique areas where you can use private capital as a solution to the challenges. Um, and third, this is an area where we're just increasingly seeing investor interest. From, from many investors outside of the United States who are, who are kind of focusing on this segment because they actually see this as a pretty good risk-adjusted return strategy to allocate their capital to. Um, likewise, um, in our financial inclusion strategy, which is focused in the global south, which for us is Latin America, Asia, and Africa, we're seeing really, really similar trends where now most of our managers are, are launching fund efforts um, over 500 million, many in the billion dollar allocation. So I think, and that's just in six years and it's probably even been less. So we're just seeing incredible trends for growth. Thank you. Thank you for that added color. Um, and we're here uh, talking about the future of impact investing in Asia, but can you tell us a little bit about opportunities you see specifically in this region? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll start with our own kind of fund manager's conviction in this market. Um, most of them are incredibly bullish on the opportunity to advance financial inclusion here. Um, partly that's because of the incredible digital adoption that's happened and the role technology can play in really delivering financial services to un underbanked consumers um, in the region. And second, our offices in China and Indonesia are incredibly optimistic about, as many have shared already today, um, that, that of the amount of interested investors coming out of either foundations, family offices, um, institutional investors, in allocating more of their capital for impact 
um, we're supporting quite a bit in terms of um, making sure that the next generation of investors understand the opportunity in front of them. Um, I think there's huge opportunity to align capital with some of the public policy and regulatory um, and regulations that are coming out, climate being an incredible, I think, opportunity and one we're really exploring. It's not a strategy we have right now. Um, so those are a couple of, of thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're at time, but is there anything else you might add for the audience who might be interested in? Well, kind of no, I would just say, um, I hope I conveyed my optimism and, um, my continued kind of conviction, I think, in the opportunity in front of us. You know, at Ford, I feel like we're just getting started. Um, we've, you know, committed about 450 million of that billion and, and just see incredible opportunity in front of us. Asia being a market we want to just continue to explore and, and allocate to. Um, so very grateful to be here and look forward to talking with all of you later. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you so much indeed, uh, Christine and Naoko, for the engaging discussion. Yeah, please. And I'd like to introduce our next guest speaker, Abhilash Mudala, uh, Chief Impact Officer at the Paul Ramsey Foundation. Uh, Abhilash is going to share with us lessons from further afield on developing an investment strategy. He will be interviewed by Dean Han, Chief Research Officer at Gene, who has an extensive experience in specific impact investing. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thanks. Is this working? Yes, it is. Oh, hello. Well, hello, everyone. Yeah, I think you do need to pick that up. Is it on? Here you go. Let me turn. I think you turn. There we go. Try that. There we go. Um, it, hello, everyone. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Abhilash Mudila, um, all the way from Melbourne in Australia. Um, Abhilash has been with the Paul Ramsey Foundation since 2019, and today is the Chief Impact Officer. Um, this is a philanthropi philanthropic foundation um, with a balance sheet of about four billion Australian dollars. Um, it's the largest philanthropic foundation in Australia. Um, he also sits on a handful of boards as a non-executive director of First Australians Capital um, and Rescue Calcutta. Prior to joining the foundation, Abhilash led the groundwork of the research that we do at the GIN. Um, he was our research director for some seven years um, close to seven years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Abhilash, it's been an honor to follow in your footsteps, um, and I am very, very keen um, to be um, talking with you today, um, and particularly about developing an impact strategy. Um, so please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Abhilash today with a round of applause. Thank you so much. So, Abhilash, um, let's start um, with the idea of impact investing and how it started at the Paul Ramsey Foundation. It's a relatively young foundation, um, founded in 2016 despite its size, um, built from the legacy of a lifetime of a philanthropist, Paul Ramsey. Um, and so philanthropy is very much at the heart of, of what it is that you do for disadvantaged Australians. Um, but how did this idea of using the endowment to augment um, that mission come about. Thanks, Dean. And, and uh, before I answer that, uh, you know, thank you to the Financial Secretary, the FSTC, and, and the GIN for um, for hosting this event and for inviting us. Look, I think we were, as a young, you pointed out that we're quite a young foundation, and I think we were actually quite fortunate to be able to follow in the footsteps of many of our peers, including actually the Ford Foundation. Um, and you know, Christine um, spoke at length about Ford's journey, and we were uh, we had the fortune of just piggybacking um, on some of the lessons that they've learned. And I think so we had, you know, early in our, um, in our history, we started with the recognition that we exist for a social purpose. Um, and so why shouldn't we ask the question, how can we pursue our social purpose with all of our assets? Um, so going beyond um, the money that we distribute in grants every year, 
Um, so this was one uh, you know, driver or motivation behind why we would want to explore impact investing is to leverage our balance sheet um, in service of our mission. Um, the second thing that we started to observe in recent years in Australia is just the growing market opportunity. Um, there were newer funds, um, there were greater funds, um, and there were a lot more ways to invest capital that would offer the financial returns that the foundation needed, um, while at the same time being able to align um, to our impact objectives. And I think the third one was just the changing norms and expectations um, in society um, that for a social purpose or mission-driven organization, it's just part of our social license to operate, um, to consider the impact of all of our work um, in the markets in which we operate, and that it really wasn't acceptable any longer to be kind of oblivious or agnostic um, to the impact that, that we uh, might be having, whether intentionally uh, or unintentionally. And so why not be intentional about all of it? Um, so those were kind of the, the motivations that uh, kicked it off. And I love how you talk about the fact that there were these pressures almost from the market to, to consider those integrations. So let's talk a little bit about what does that impact investing strategy look like today? So I'd, I'd say there's two broad buckets. Um, the newest element that we're actually uh, very much in the process of developing right now is to apply a very broad responsible investing policy um, to the entire balance sheet. Um, so this involves looking closely at all of the funds um, that we've invested in, um, whether directly or through um, wealth managers, to understand what are they doing in terms of ESG and impact? Um, do they have um, any goals that align to the SDGs? Are they signatories of the PRI? Do they produce impact reports? Um, do they um, seek to measure how they contribute to um, certain types of development goals? Um, you know, and, and so on. What types of industries are in these portfolios? And then doing the analysis from an ESG lens to then help inform our investment committee, um, use that information um, and make better choices about how to balance our portfolio. The second part of our strategy, actually, again, and you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, um, we actually uh, mirrored Ford Foundation. Um, early, um, when we launched our impact investing strategy, one of the first things we publicly um, announced was an ambition to commit 10% of our balance sheet um, to impact investments. Um, and we're about three years into that journey. Um, we've committed close to 4% um, of our balance sheet to date, which is about 120 million um, Australian dollars to a variety of impact investments. There's a few different types. There's some of them are direct investments, um, such as loans to social enterprises. For instance, we've um, provided a loan to a social enterprise that um, works with um, youth living with a disability um, and uh, the objective being to provide them with job training um, and employment opportunities. Um, we've also invested in a range of funds, um, one being First Australians Capital, um, which is um, an Indigenous-led fund manager in Australia that's looking to um, invest in Indigenous um, small and medium enterprises um, in the country. Um, and then uh, we've also invested in a variety of different social impact bonds where the return to the investor is tied to the achievement um, of a predetermined um, social objective, in our case, typically related to education or early childhood development. Those are great examples, thank you. Um, now, I know you didn't get to that impact investing and responsible um, investing approach immediately. It evolved over time, didn't it? And so let's talk a little bit about some of the smaller steps that you took in the beginning to actually get there. Yeah, look, it absolutely was a journey. Um, when we first received the mandate from our board um, to try this out, um, it really was in terms of just going out and, and trying it out. Um, you know, uh, be opportunistic, um, invest in a few different things, um, see what goes well, see what doesn't, see what you can learn, and then we can refine the strategy um, accordingly. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, we went out to market, we were quite opportunistic. Um, we had a look at what was available, um, you know, met with a range of different fund managers and entrepreneurs, um, and invested in quite a, a bit of a, um, a potpourri of different, different opportunities. Um, after about a year to 18 months, we started to look at the market more closely, look at what was in our portfolio, 
Um, and one thing we realized was that there were actually opportunities across the risk return impact spectrum. Um, and in particular, quite a few very early stage, high risk, innovative catalytic investments that may not offer risk adjusted market returns, at least in the short term. Um, but then there were also many other opportunities that were um, offering commercial risk adjusted returns while having a positive impact. And so then we delineated our portfolio between these two buckets. Um, and then I think the third step in the journey was what I described earlier, which we're just launching now, is the broader responsible investing and ESG lens that applies to um, everything in the balance sheet. So it was a it was a step by step journey. Sure. And when we were preparing for our discussion today, you shared with me that initially that there were quite a lot of myths and skepticism, perhaps, that were held about impact investing strategies. I also know that at the gin, you were often at the forefront of dispelling some of those myths. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the myths that you encountered. And the moment that you realized that your colleagues within the foundation um, realized that impact, and strat impact investing strategies could indeed be viable. Tell me a little bit about those moments. I think um, there are a wide range of different myths that exist about impact investing, and we face these in, in the Australian market as well, including myths around the, um, the idea that impact investments are necessarily concessionary or necessarily small in scale um, or only belong in private markets. Um, uh, and then also the idea that ESG data is just for reporting and compliance purposes, but it's largely fluffy and doesn't really have a lot of business value. Um, and, you know, we, we faced a lot of these different myths. And I'll, I guess I'll, I'll touch on two specific examples. Um, on the first one, uh, around the idea that impact investing is perhaps small scale and doesn't necessarily attract institutional capital, one of the elements of our strategy has always been to be either the first investor or one of the first investors to play a catalytic role um, to try and demonstrate the viability and scalability and commercial uh, potential of impact investing funds. Um, in fact, the first investment that, that we made was in a disability housing fund. Um, and we were one amongst um, a handful of initial investors. And the idea was just to provide some demonstration capital to this new fund manager. It was also a first time fund manager so that they could use it um, to build a small portfolio of disability housing um, apartments and try and demonstrate their thesis that this can be done with commercial returns and positive impact. Um, they uh, got off to a really good start um, and within uh, 18 months actually went to market and raised $150 million um, from a, a large um, institutional investor um, from a Wall Street bank. Uh, and so, and when we were talking to that bank, they spoke to us as part of their due diligence. Um, they actually told us explicitly that if it wasn't for the Paul Ramsey Foundation and a couple of the other initial investors putting that money in and taking that initial risk to demonstrate uh, the potential that they would have never even um, taken a second look at it. Um, and so that was an eye-opening moment um, for our board um, that we could play this catalytic role in um, helping to build the market and helping to establish um, funds of this scale. Um, if there's time, I can give one more example. Absolutely, yeah. go for it. One more example, much more recently when we started looking at uh, applying the responsible investing uh, lens to our portfolio and started actually gathering ESG data, um, we learned that, uh, well, first we learned that most of our funds we didn't, were actually performing quite well on ESG, which was, which was um, you know, a positive. But we also identified that there was one fund um, in our portfolio that had 20% exposure to a specific um, industry that, um, I guess, the, the uh, a diplomatic way to put it was was probably inconsistent um, with our mission. Um, and we hadn't realized uh, through all of the other analysis that we'd done um, that we actually had a fund in our portfolio with this particular concentration. Um, and so immediately this compelled the IC to act, the investment committee, um, to um, divest um, from that particular fund and reallocate that capital um, elsewhere um, towards another fund manager with ESG um, characteristics that, that you know, much more closely aligned with our, with our mission. And so this compelled the investment committee um, to realize that, okay, ESG data is not all just for reporting and compliance, but it can actually provide insights that can help us make better decisions um, uh, for the foundation more broadly. Sure. 
Those are fantastic uh, um, examples of evolution. And a great segue into my last question for you is, is that I think that one of the crucial roles that philanthropic foundations actually play is to demonstrate what is possible in impact investing strategies and for capital markets at large. Um, and one, one of the things that I wanted to do was just say, what are the, some of the, the lessons that you think that you've learned over your, your time with the Paul Ramsey Foundation that you could share with others in the audience here that might help them also understand what is possible? I'll share, I'll share two lessons. I think um, earlier I was describing that for us it's been a journey, um, starting uh, with some experimentation, uh, experimental um, investments and, and going from there. And so I think the lesson for us from that has been that, you know, um, make a start um, and don't wait for the perfect strategy or uh, the perfect set of circumstances. So sort of perfect is the enemy of the good um, is, is a phrase that, that we often use. Um, make a start, learn along the journey, refine and improve. Um, I think the second lesson is that supply and demand can, kind, can sometimes actually spur each other on. Um, when we started and we announced an ambition to um, invest 10% of our balance sheet in impact investments, it, it, it's kind of through uh, an ambition and an aspiration out into the market that there's a lot more capital um, that's available. And many other you know, foundations and other investors did the same. In parallel, there were many new fund managers um, emerging who were going public with their fundraising ambitions of, I want to raise a $200 million fund or a 300 or a 400. Um, and I think the fact that um, both of these were happening in parallel helped spur each other on um, to develop a much larger market um, than perhaps existed um, a few years ago. Um, and I think the last thing that I'll say is being in this industry for many, many years, I think I've noticed that it's, it's a very, very friendly um, and open industry where people are really willing to share. And so if someone's new to impact investing, you know, it's not a super competitive space. Um, I think if you go to your peers or others that have already started and say, can you just walk me through what you've done? Can I um, learn from you about your journey? Um, tell me a bit more about this and that. People are always very willing and open to share. Um, and I think you know, that's something that um, should be taken advantage of. Fantastic. I love those messages of, of just start somewhere and, and, and draw on the experiences of others. Ablush, thank you. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And I'm confident that our audience has learned so much. Um, I certainly have. Um, and please join me in thanking Arbalash for t um, joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much again, uh, Abhilash and uh, Dean, for your enlightening sharing. Yeah, definitely impact investing is a rewarding journey. So expanding on that, um, I would like to invite uh, our next panel uh, with Mr. Daniel Fong as the moderator, the vice chairman of FSDC and senior counsel of Dark Clock's Chamber, together with the fellow distinguished panelists. Please uh, come onto the stage. Yeah, the topic will be promising climate solutions. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody to this session, uh, Promising Climate Solutions, which, as the title indicates, uh, demonstrates that uh, both FSDC and GIN are not just talk shops. We actually propose and promote and identify solutions. And with us today, we're very uh, pleased to have um, Hester de Casper, who's head of operations, East Asia and Pacific for IFC, Joining us, and we have Jeffrey Sito, Head of Emerging Markets, New Forests. And last but not least, Gunit Banga, uh, uh, Executive Director of the Caravel Group. Now, before I ask uh, each of our speakers to share with us their perceptions um, as to uh, climate solutions and what challenges we, we face, I'd, I'd like to set the scene by identifying two seismic shifts uh, which are critical uh, in the 15 years ahead. The, the first is that uh, whereas most people in this room uh, are well aware that China has the largest electrical vehicle market in the world and that gap is growing, um, many may not know that uh, China uh, has the biggest and fastest growing 
um, carbon market in the world, and that will also grow. That um, is not surprising because China is a manufacturing superpower, both uh, in terms of good, green, bad, green, and we also know that the carbon development in terms of trading in China has been ongoing for 15 years. It started in Tianjin, 2008. Um, they also had it in Beijing, 2009, Shanghai, 2010, and so on. Today, there are eight different carbon markets in China, but the uh, standards are uneven. The operational procedures are different, and uh, China is looking to standardize operations, development, and of course to take that market international because uh, carbon trading is not uh, restricted to any particular sovereign territory, it's global. And therefore, in order to interface, let's say, with the most mature carbon market world today, which is that of the European Union, the only solution for carbon trading in China is to bring it to Hong Kong, standardize it, make it global, um, take advantage of our uh, regulatory transparency, our legal system, our independent judiciary, etc., and kill two birds with one stone. In other words, make um, Hong Kong the leading global carbon market um, in East Asia and Pacific and possibly eventually the world. Secondly, um, to uh, internationalize RMB because it will be denominated in RMB. Now, the other seismic development is, is this, which is interesting. Um, whereas uh, for the past 10 years in the United States, um, large cap um, carbon funds trading in the public markets have, have outperformed the markets. Uh, last year, it underperformed the market, and that trend will grow. And, and the, the, the reason for that is not, not far to, uh, to seek because um, it's uh, reaching considerable headwinds, both social and political. So in three states, for example, Florida, Oklahoma, and Texas, um, there is a prohibition on government pension funds investing uh, in any vehicles with an ESG mandate. Now, that is serious stuff, but is it all doom and gloom? Not necessarily, and the outlook is a bit more nuanced because we, we now see a shift, at least in the US and, and, and possibly Europe too, that um, the investment is moving into uh, private markets. That's an important trend, and I'm, I'm sure our speakers can speak to that in a moment. The other trend is secretization. A securitization is important so that um, we see the, the shift away from traditional forms of investment in public equity. We see um, actually people looking at securitization, for example, of car loans for electric vehicle purchases in the United States. But let, let me just set the scene by making those two points, but um, invite um, our speakers then to reflect on that, starting, I think, with Gunit in Asia. So Gunit, please tell us what your perception is and how you see th things developing. Um, thanks for that uh, introduction. <coughs> Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm a little unwell and I've got a broken back I'm recovering from, so just bear with me if I'm fidgety and, and need to scream in pain. Um, <laughs> I think when I started, uh, when I entered into the field of impact investing in 2017, you could count the number of people who would have showed up in a room like this on one hand. Um, and so, you know, in six, seven years, we're at a full house. I heard there was, you know, a wait list for tickets, which is fantastic. Um, the more people who are talking about this, the more people who are active in this space, um, the more chance we have of getting to the right results and meeting the targets that have been set um, for 2050 by the UN. Um, just on your question, I think I will focus my answers on India primarily because it's where a lot of uh, my focus has been in the last few years. And I think you, know, you, you made a couple of very interesting points about where China is. And I think um, if you look at India demographically, um, structurally, legally, 
you know, there's a rule of law, it's all in English. They have 500 million people between, between the ages of 20 and 45, English speaking, college educated, digitally savvy. That's your biggest consumer block around the world, for the, in the world for the next 15, 20 years. Um, and you've also got the digital, uh, the tech um, acumen that has been acquired by India from outsourcing by global companies into India, running these giant outsourcing um, operations. And now you're seeing the Indians actually wanting to own the tech and start their own businesses. You've got a very vibrant startup community which has connections to international players already. Um, I think um, two things that I do want to say is, um, you know, the, India has set its net zero goal for 2070 and have committed to be uh, at 50% of, uh, of electricity being produced by renewable sources by 2030, which is uh, pretty close. Um, if anybody knows anything about India, electricity is coal and a eh, little bit of solar, a little bit of water, a little bit of gas, but essentially coal powered economy. So for them to say that 50% of that will be gone in the next seven years, that's a, that's a bold statement. And I think um, I have a very strong feeling that they'll be able to do it simply because of the, um, the well, a, a bunch of reasons actually. Um, the uh, India has an abundance of the inputs required to make green hydrogen and other green fuels, um, and using waste materials to make these. Um, you know, if, uh, the Earth has about two billion tons of municipal waste on it. One point six billion tons of that sits in India. There's technologies that are now being created and I've seen and I'm invested in that take municipal waste, um, process it in such a way so that you have green fuels for planes, for automobiles, for heavy industry, uh, industrial vehicles, and hopefully in the next 18 months you'll have them for trains. So your entire auto system is now not just, uh, you don't just have the opportunity for batteries, but you have the option for green fuels, oh, and ships, sorry, I forgot about ships. Um, secondly, you've got a um, very vibrant local capital market, which despite what was going on in the second half of last year in the private markets and the public markets globally, India was still sheltered somewhat because of uh, the liquidity, the um, smaller number and the smaller size of financings that were being done um, across the scale, but it didn't slow down. I mean, India in the last two months of uh, 2022, I think $300 million were raised for um, seed funding, and early stage funding um, in, um, in 23 deals. So, you know, some, some substantial investments taking place even when the rest of the world was shut down. Um, I'm gonna stop there and, and I can keep going, but I think well, we went right out of time. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Gunit. I, I'm gonna uh, shift the focus um, slightly broader uh, beyond South Asia. And I'm gonna ask Hester to talk a little bit about um, her perceptions of this field, because Hester is uh, head of operations for East Asia and Pacific I IFC, and she's been based out of Hong Kong, I believe, for the last three years. So tell us um, how, how the view looks from your office. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and thanks to the organizers, uh, FSDC and uh, uh, the financial secretary and the gin for having us today. It's really a pleasure. Um, so for those who don't know the International Finance Corporation or IFC, we're a development finance institution, part of the World Bank group, and we're focused on private sector in emerging markets and developing economies. Uh, we're an investor. We invest on commercial terms. We're also a provider of advisory services to businesses and governments. And we think of ourselves in many ways as the original impact investor. We've been doing impact investment for almost 70 years in emerging markets uh, globally. So we have a huge amount of experience in this area. And we've always thought of the positive environmental and social impacts that we wanted to make alongside the commercial financial returns that we're pursuing. Um, so 
focusing now on the, the sort of the climate finance space and the, what we see um, in the markets that we work in, the ones that uh, we operate in emerging markets, uh, and specifically, I suppose, in, in East Asia Pacific, where, where we're based now. Um, I think I would say that the climate finance landscape right now is obviously rapidly growing. I think uh, that's no, no mystery to anyone here. Uh, it's rapidly diversifying and, and branching out. And, and I think that it's quite, uh, as some of the previous speakers pointed out, it's becoming quite mainstream. Um, and uh, I think I want to make a couple of points on, I guess, caveats on each of those. Uh, first, that it's growing rapidly, but it is not growing rapidly enough. Uh, certainly in, in the sense that we have a very limited time frame that we're operating in to uh, avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And that window is, is rapidly, rapidly closing. Um, it's not uh, scaling fast enough. So the, the size of the financing that's going into climate solutions is inadequate. It's certainly increased quite a bit, but it is by no means uh, at the scale that we need. And then I think the final point I would make is that it's not going to the markets where it's needed the most. And obviously, uh, because we focus on emerging markets, uh, there's two things that come to mind for me. One is that um, if you think about the industries where you get the majority of emissions, um, big industrial um, processes, steel, cement, fertilizer, chemicals, energy production, um, most of the industrial emissions that we can anticipate in the next 30, 50 years are going to come from this part of the world. They're going to come from Asia. They're going to come from the emerging markets. And the capital to decarbonize these industries is not going to these markets yet. It needs to go there. And then secondly, we've got uh, low-income countries, uh, countries that don't have big industry, that aren't attracting big investment. These are the countries that we hear about when we think about the people who are experiencing the worst of the climate impacts today, but who have contributed the least to the actual emissions that are causing the problems that we're facing and the pollution that causes the problems we're facing. Those countries are also not receiving sufficient capital for adaptation. So that's how I see the, the landscape right now in climate th finance. Th thanks so much, Hesta, for reminding us uh, that, it, in fact, um, the, um, the level, the different levels of development uh, in Asia um, is striking. And to talk about Asia as one entity is probably misleading. And also the timely reminder that we're talking about equity. We talk about inequities as well as equities. And, and, and that is um, most striking in Asia, too. Let me um, move on to just uh, take the camera uh, to a wider lens, and I'll invite um, uh, Jeffrey to tell us a little bit about what's happening, because I, I know he, he looks at Australia, he looks at the US, and so, so let's um, lift the camera up a little bit higher. Tell us what your perceptions are. Thank you, and thank you to the organizers for, for having us here in such an important forum. Um, just a little bit about New Forest. Um, we are the second largest forestry fund manager in the world. We invest in sustainable tree plantations and one of the largest nature-based solutions investors as well. Um, collectively, since our inception in 2005, sustainability has been a, a, a very large theme in terms of how we invest. Um, we currently manage about seven billion US dollars across 1.1 million hectares of land, so ten, about 10 times the size of Hong Kong, um, and four geographical strategies. So that is North America in California, our head office in Australia New Zealand, um, and then the two emerging markets, um, with each, which is Southeast Asia, and more recently, Africa. Just turning to climate finance, it's always been an integral part of our business and our investment thesis. Um, we are the, one of the largest uh, issuers of carbon offsets in the Californian cap and trade scheme, the ARB32 market. Um, we were one of the first, or we were the first issuer of carbon offsets into the Australian ERF scheme or ACU. Um, we are issuers under the New Zealand ETS scheme, uh, NZUs, and these are the three compliance markets we operate in. And in the emerging markets, we are now turning our attention to the voluntary markets. 
Um, so under Vera and gold standard and the other types of, of standards there. Um, and that is a fast growing market. In fact, I think in the last three to four years, it's, it's grown fast, obviously not fast enough, but we are seeing quite a bit of interest in there. And what we see um, amongst you know, your traditional fund investors is a renewed interest. So those large pension funds, um, philanthropic organizations, even sovereign wealth funds. But the real difference between, you know, in the last four or five years for our business is the corporates. And corporates invariably all have net zero targets and they are driving a lot of funding into this space to be able to access and help them to achieve, uh, to achieve net zero. So in terms of private sector, we all recognise and governments across all of Asia recognise that in order to achieve their national determined contributions or NDCs, private sector has to play a role in that. And as we try to build our business and scale quickly, albeit slowly, because we've been in Asia since 2012, um, we do recognise that uh, there is money flowing into this area. Th thanks so much, Jeffrey. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about perceptions. We've talked about challenges. Um, let, let me drill down a little bit and talk about um, opportunities and also uh, solutions, if, if, if I may. So, um, Gunit, can I invite you to talk a little bit about um, the role of um, recycling capital and bridging the gap with the middle box? Um, sure, yeah, you can. This is actually a... Um a program that we are working with the Indian government on. Um, and we're combining all the major stakeholders from academia, research, uh, the government, whether that's na inter uh, national government, state government, municipal governments, uh, local town governments, to uh, industry players. And what we're doing is we are um, sourcing technology globally, and then building teams from each of these stakeholders to develop that technology and get it to a stage of first commercialization, then it can be sold onwards into a fund. So by doing that, I mean, it's cheaper to do it in India than anywhere else pretty much. And my view, if anyone, you know, people who've been to India, it's so diverse, so many different languages, government, the law, regulation, um, cultures, issues. If there's a problem um, that we can find a solution to that works in India. I think you can apply that pretty much anywhere globally and with some tweaks, you can get that to work. Um, you know, we've partnered up with a number of uh, governments to provide technology into India. So this is all work in progress, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be addressing sort of eight main areas of sustainability, of which climate is the biggest one. Um, and for India, climate stems from uh, energy transition and, uh, and waste management and waste and water management. So those two are really going to be the driving forces of this project going forward. It's, you know, for India to, to meet its net zero targets, it's something like they need to invest some, between 16 and $22 trillion over the next 27 years, which India doesn't have. And so, you know, the government now has realized we need to get money from, um, investors abroad who are typically, who historically have been a little bit skeptical of going into India because of some of the um, crony capitalism, you know, the, uh, let's just say, less than legitimate um, promoters and, and, and businesses. But the government's made some moves around that to allay some of those concerns and build in new measures where, you know, the general tax, sales tax will be eliminated for foreigners, tax on, um, capital gains will be limited for foreigners if you come in through a certain entity. Um, and so they're all doing this in that we develop these technologies, we get international funding, and then we scale it across the world. Something like what you were saying, right? It's, uh, India becomes a, I guess, hub for seeding and, de and for getting the commer first commercial uh, contract for whatever technology there is and then using our network to seed it wherever it can be used. So that's uh, going to be challenging, but I think, you know, we're, on the, we're trying to get people engaged and working together. And I think that's the biggest problem is that countries are organi always going to have in dynamics and politics and all, 
But if you get stakeholders together and move in the same direction, we're going to have a magnified impact going forward. I think that's starting to happen now. Thank, thank you for that. I, I'm going to scramble the order slightly and ask Jeffrey to um, identify, uh, if you can, uh, opportunities um, in the four markets that you've been talking about. Yeah. Um, so maybe we should just start with the challenges first because there's, there's quite a few challenges. Um, and when we talk about you know, potential opportunities, addressing those challenges actually creates those opportunities. So in the emerging, I'll talk about the emerging market space a little bit more because the regulated markets are probably better defined. Um, but having said that, um, you know, in terms of where we invest in, in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, the uncertain policy environments and, and the regulatory environments are certainly a massive challenge. And if you think about it just from a, a carbon point of view and carbon offsets, not to mention land tenor, because forestry is a tremendously land intensive exercise, um, the, the different policy regimes around governments trying to achieve NDCs is, is still uncertain. So you've got Indonesia as one of the very large uh, providers of carbon markets, and we just don't know what they're going to do with any offsets that we produce. And, you know, private sector and financial investors hate uncertainty. Just tell us the rules, we'll price it in, and we'll figure it out. But give us that consistent policy environment. Um, the other part of it is around, you know, COP and the transferability of carbon. So we, you've probably heard about Article 6.2 and 6.4 and the resolution of that um, and corresponding adjustments across different um, users of those carbon offsets. And so that, that needs some, some resolution um, around as well. Um, and I think the probably I'll just, just touching on the last is the, the reputational risk associated with the voluntary carbon markets. And so, you know, you, have, you, you see a lot of negative press um, in the markets around red plus schemes and, and, and all that sort of stuff. But I think the previous speaker put it really well when he said perfect is the enemy of good enough. And, you know, we have to recognise that we have an imperfect system. It's a new system, but standardisation will come and regulation will come. But the recognition that we have an imperfect system means that we just, we just need to start today. Because yeah. if we don't, we've got to run out of time. And I'll give you some statistics, right? Since 2001, there's been 437 million hectares of trees that have been deforestation across the world. That's emitted 176 billion tonnes of CO2. And deforestation occurs at a rate of around 25 million hectares a year. So instead of arguing about a couple of red plus schemes uh, in a newspaper article that have not been credited properly, let's concentrate on what the big picture here looks like and let's just get started on that. Because ultimately, if we don't and we aren't proving out this model, we're not going to get there. The land use sector emits around a quarter of the 40 plus gigatons of carbon emitted in the world. Mm. The land use sector has to also mitigate its emissions. And stopping that deforestation through red plus schemes and paying for that, that's, that's an integral part of climate change mitigation. It's not just about sequestration, it's also about avoiding those emissions. And I think that's lost on a lot of people today. And there's just too much negative press. And that's keeping those large institutional pools of capital, the real, where all the money is to be able yeah. to scale this, it's keeping them away from these markets. And we have to resolve that. Thank you. I'm going to ask um, uh, Hester to um, talk a little bit about um, blended finance as a possible solution <laughs> to the problems we're facing. So um, I may speak a little bit about blended finance, but I actually want to respond to some of the things that uh, um, my, my co-panelists have, have mentioned, if you don't mind. Um, and, and there's so much that we can say about this that I, we certainly don't have time to say at all. But uh, uh, first, in terms of the challenges that you've mentioned, I think, I mean, IFC, we see them very much uh, the same. And you mentioned also the regulatory environment, the policy environment has to pull investment. Um, governments now, many of them are in a tight fiscal situation. They need private sector to come in and step in and do, make a big percentage of these investments in, in the green economy. And in order to do that, the policy and regulatory environment really has to be supportive. Um, I think the other, the other piece that you mentioned, um, getting the private capital to feel like the risks are manageable 
is a big part of what we as uh, multilateral development banks do. And, and then uh, sort of what you were describing as well in terms of piloting, uh, testing, demonstrating success stories with uh, models that then can be replicated. Those are really important um, roles that we can play. But um, from IFC's perspective, I mean, blended finance is a big part of that de-risking story. We, are, we don't do a lot of blended finance currently in Asia Pacific, but we want to do more, particularly in the climate space and especially in middle-income countries. Um, and it's really a proof of concept uh, function that the blended finance plays. Once you've, you've got um, someone who's willing to take first loss or you've got a mechanism that um, uh, increases interest rates over time, then investors will be able to feel confident that they can put their, fin their financial uh, assets into investments in some of these spaces that are really untested and, and quite new. Um, what we see in terms of solutions that I have seen that, that's also kind of, I guess, on the, on the newer side, obviously green bonds have been around for a while now. We started piloting them more than a decade ago, and now it's a trillion dollar asset class. Um, now you, we can't get to net zero just by doing uh, green bonds, right? So there's plenty of companies that don't have a green story to tell. They don't have green assets to finance yet. These companies we have to provide uh, capital to, and we do this through things like sustainability-linked bonds, sustainability-linked loans. Um, now there is um, uh, climate transition finance that we're starting to talk about, and you may have heard about the just energy transition that IFC and ADB and uh, some of the G7 countries, the GFANS banks are participating in, providing money to countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, South Africa, in order to transition much more quickly away from coal than they had, I guess, planned in their NDCs. Um, these kinds of approaches, which are innovative, they're public-private, um, they're risky, these are the kinds of things we need to do, be doing much, much more of um, to, to solve this problem. Can I just um, add on Please something? But, um, um, let me say this, because we actually have, um, I think, eight minutes left. Okay. I, oh, I can... Uh, allow for more time, but I, I would in invite every panelist, if they wish to comment on um, the other's um, presentations sure. and also to make concluding remarks. So yeah, I uh, mean, go ahead, Gudi, sure, you, yeah. you have I, I three minutes. Just, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, pressure's on. Um, I think uh, two points that you made which really stand out for me are um, risk management and people looking at risk the wrong way. They're looking at the risk of losing profit as opposed to the risk of losing our planet. Um, and that needs to change. And that ties into my second point, which is that most private companies are still looking one, two, or three years ahead. They're not looking at 25 years ahead, right? And so until that, those dynamics start to change materially, I think it's gonna be very hard for a CEO to, well, no, he'll, to make the right decision for everyone, or for the, the greater good is easy, but to satisfy his shareholders and get his bonus and all that, and everyone's got you know, selfish interests, we, we're not perfect, but I think that is something that governments need to start really, I don't know if you can legislate it somehow, or put pressure on, or um, shareholders need to be much more um, advocating for that much more, it's like, take a five-year view, it's 25 years approximately till 2050, have five five-year plans, much like China does, and adjust as you go. I think um, the vast majority of people, A, don't know enough or know the wrong things, and that's, um, that's part of not getting the right information out there consistently in a collaborative way, and then you know, people saying the same things one again and again and again, and people start to believe it because when you have 10 different viewpoints on the same issue, climate change doesn't exist still apparently, then it's hard for Joe Bloggs or a farmer in India to really care because all he cares about is putting food on his children's table at night, right? So I think there needs to be a lot of clarity around how private sector operates um, in terms of their time horizon and take a loss the short term in order to have gains in the long term, 
you're, invest by, you're investing in a future organization by investing in sustainability today. If you don't do it, you're not going to be fit for future. You're not going to be around three or five years from now. That's what I tell my chairman slash father um, several times a day. So you know, hopefully it'll sink in at some point. All right. Thank, thanks for that, Gunit. Um, Jeffrey, any last words for the audience? Yeah, so um, blended finance is a big theme for us. So we have our second Asian fund in the market with a blended finance product. Um, and that's partly in response to tapping different pools of investors and different pools of capital to achieve different outcomes. So with our Tropical Asia Forest Fund number two, we actively target, we intentionally target impact outcomes. And that's across the three SDGs of livelihoods, climate, and biodiversity. And we, what we want to show in this fund is that the integration of impact outcomes and generating a commercial financial return are not mutually exclusive. In fact, we're trying to show that that is business as usual. And when you talk about risk management, that generation of those impact outcomes, and I'll give you a very quick example. It's you know, around community and livelihoods. When you engage with community, you get that social license to operate. You get land tenor, but you also get risk mitigation. Um, and it, fires is a great example. 99% of fires in Asian forestry is started by local communities for hunting and gathering or land clearing. That engagement reduces my risk of fire in my plantations. And I think what people don't realize is when you talk about risk return, reducing risk also enables you to achieve a higher risk adjusted return. So it's not just the top line, it's also the bottom line. So just in conclusion, um, in order to make this work in these emerging markets, and this is what we're trying to prove out right now, is that we all have a part to play. So we've talked about the part that governments have to play, uh, private sector and other types of funding organisations, and us as individuals. We need to tell the people who invest our money, we need to hold them accountable. The people, that, the companies that we buy products from, we need to hold them accountable. And with all that, and it's going to take all of it together, uh, we... we have a small chance of mitigating climate change. H H Hester, last words from the IFC. Well, I, I want to end on a, a, a hopeful note because I mean I, I agree with my my colleagues here on stage that the the prospects are right now they look pretty grim, and uh, we really it is a, an all hands on deck moment. Um, but the great news, of course, is that the capital is already there. We have $400 trillion worth of assets under management that can be deployed towards climate solutions. We have technology already in place. We have smart people working on this problem everywhere around the world, particularly young people and people in emerging markets. Um, so that's the good news, I think. And from uh, the multilateral development bank standpoint, um, we really try to bridge the gaps that remain wherever they happen to be, whether that's on the policy side and getting the regulatory environments in good shape, whether it's on doing some uh, early project development to get new technologies and innovative ideas launched, whether it's creating mobilization platforms so that institutional investors can come in alongside us, invest in our portfolio without having to do the extensive due diligence and, and take the time to invest in very small businesses the way that IFC does, we're trying to identify where those shortcomings are and, and bridge them for, for the rest of the investment community. And um, I don't know, I guess I, I would just agree very strongly with my colleagues that this is truly a, a group effort, but we need everybody. Um, but it's great to see the room so full and, and such an engaged audience, and I think we've got to... I, I'd like to say uh, right. two things before wrapping up. The first is that by the time I get to the end of my sentence, one hectare of rainforest would have disappeared forever. Um, so hence the urgency and the um, compelling morality of what everybody in this room is trying their level best to do. And the other thing I want to say uh, is that everybody on this panel um, d deserves kudos for finishing well within the allotted time. In fact, we started late. We started maybe 
five, 10 minutes late, but we finished within time. So some people get carbon credits, but we get time credits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, uh, Hasta, Ganesh, and Jeffrey for the excellent sharing. Thank you. Our next panel will be moderated by Ms. Maud Safari uh, Monat from uh, Jean. Uh, Maud, yes, please. Yes, you have an extensive experience in impact investing in emerging economy across Asia Pacific. So, uh, Maud, maybe I'll leave you to introduce your uh, panelists. Sure. Um, may my panelists come on stage? <laughs> so, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephanie Choi. Stephanie, please join us. Uh, Danny Howell, uh, Raleigh from uh, Sarona, and we are missing Charles. Yes, wonderful. So, um, thank you so much. Ah, first picture. Wonderful, thank you. So, thank you so much um, to this wonderful audience for coming today and staying after the, the break. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and I really would like to thank the Financial Service and Development Council, and in particular, uh, Dr. King and Rocky, uh, for their support in organizing this event. Um, if you um, give me the liberty to introduce myself, um, I am the senior advisor of the Global Impact Investing Network. I'm based in Hong Kong. Um, and um, this panel on financial inclusion is particularly close to my heart. Um, I've been in this space basically since 2007, so when the term impact investment was coined. And I started this journey with what was at the time a very small asset manager. And we started by looking at what was microcredit institution in emerging Asia. And those microcredit institutions would provide tiny loans to women, mostly. And those microcredit institutions grew became basically uh, regulated, became uh, deposit-taking institutions, and started to provide even more financial services and deposits and remittances, uh, unlocking really um, what I would say critical infrastructure in financial inclusion in emerging uh, Asia. Um, and today I'm really pleased to discuss uh, the new trends and development of financial inclusion with my distinguished panelists. Um, and I'd like actually to ask them to introduce themselves and uh, their organization, maybe starting with Stephanie. Thank you. So um, pleased to meet you, everybody, and a pleasure to be on this panel today. Uh, I'm Stephanie Choi, the Sustainable and Impact Investing Strategist uh, for Asia at UBS CIO. Um, UBS is um, a committed uh, bank to sustainable and impact investing. We've been doing this for 25 years, and sustainable investing is preferred at the bank. So really excited to represent our bank and be on this panel with the esteemed guests today. Ready? Hi, everyone. So thrilled to be here. I think this is the first uh, post-COVID event of Jean um, here in Asia. Uh, my name is Raleigh Rizbanoli, and I'm a partner and head of investments at Serona Asset Management. We're headquartered in Canada, and I recently opened an office in Singapore about a year and a half ago. Um, our bread and butter is private investments in emerging um, markets. Particularly, we partner with local fund managers and we co-invest with them in, in uh, particular portfolio companies. We've been doing impact investing since the start of our 13-year journey, and uh, more recently we defined climate and gender as, as the two pillars, um, and really the lenses through which we encourage our local investees to, to conduct their investment process and operations. Thank you, Rally. Danny? Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and um, really enjoying the sessions we've had today, and thank you for, for organising this to FSDC and to Jin. Uh, Danny Howe, I'm working for Micro Capital Group. So we're a European headquartered uh, private credit impact inclusive finance uh, asset manager <clears throat> with a 15 year history. We're headquartered in Luxembourg. We manage around 2 billion euros in assets. Most of our investors are actually based in Switzerland. They're Swiss family offices. Most of our lending we conduct through Silk Road countries in Central Asia. Um, my appointment here is really as CEO for Asia to drive the growth of 
our business through the region in Asia Pacific, both looking for investors and also new markets to invest into. Uh, my name is Charles Lee. I used to work in this hall with my friend uh, Bonnie over there, thinking about investing, impact investing for a long time. I retired, and uh, but I have an office uh, on the other side of the door, uh, upstairs, and uh, trying to figure out how truly we are able to do impact investing. Thank you, Charles. So financial inclusion has actually more than a decade of track record, and many of you have been in this space uh, for as long uh, as that. Um, and when we look today at data, uh, in particular the uh, impact annual survey, which is released by the Global Impact Investment Network, we see that financial services, financial inclusion, it's almost 20% uh, of the global asset under management. And uh, even recent studies produced by uh, Tameo in particular uh, show that uh, uh, private investors uh, are actually looking at it. It's almost 50% of, of the flows. So really, uh, a track record has been built already. Um, what, what are the reasons for this success? And maybe turning to you, Stephanie, you have been in this space for a long time. Sure. So, um, in fact, uh, financial inclusion was um, the first ever impact investing deal that ever crossed UBS <laughs> shelves. Um, so, so we, we do have a, a strong interest in this space, and throughout the time, we have seen um, strong interest not only from uh, you know a microfinance angle, but also um, in kind of broader digital financial inclusion, which actually underpins almost every single impact investment opportunity that have crossed our shelves um, in recent years. And I think financial inclusion is attractive from an inf impact investing perspective um, based on both the breadth of um, opportunities available as well as the depth of impact. So by that, I mean um, financial inclusion uh, really cuts through multiple SDGs and it's not superficial. This is not like slapping SDG logos on pitch deck type. We're actually saying that access to financial services is an underlying metric underlying these goals that um, you know, the, the UN wants to track. And so the, the multiplier effects and the impact is very visible, and yet at the same time, the financial and social outcomes are pretty collinear. And by that, I mean that we actually generate financial returns because of social outcomes that have been achieved instead of like you know being a coincidental um, outcome. And so you have that uh, depth of impact transparency um, that gives impact investors some comfort. But at the same time, you know, from a portfolio standpoint, there's really a breadth of opportunities for them to select, whether it's private credit, you know, like your, your forte, but also, you know, in private equity um, investments in digital financial inclusion or fintech plays. So you, you can really express that view across multiple asset classes, and that makes it very approachable for impact investors today. So depth and breadth, that's your message. Would you agree then? Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. I think that the, the size of the opportunity, the universe of the investment potential is quite large. Um, and so that can attract a lot of investment that has capacity to, to absorb a lot of investment. Um, as Stephanie said, I do think that there's this opportunity to create significant tangible value in terms of impact related outcomes. The ability uh, with what our fund does, for example, to create benefits for micro small businesses and these are the backbones of these developing markets in terms of the economy, the ability to lift these communities out of poverty to help build communities, it's a very tangible, um, substantial benefit you can create through impact. Um, in terms of our experience over the 15 years of the fund, uh, I think the size of the investment pool creates this opportunity to tailor your investment to specific themes, which I think investors like. So if you've got a thematic approach, which is around uh, women entrepreneurs in certain markets, the size of the overall opportunity, I think, creates that ability to tailor your investment. And there's a range of different investment funds that have specific thematic-based approaches. Um, our focus is on Silk Road countries through Central Asia. But even within that, we can work on specific projects as a project at the moment with the Dutch uh, Sovereign Wealth Group, FMO, to look at um, Muslim women entrepreneurs in Tajikistan. And so I think that the, the broad scope of, of the environment creates this ability to do things which I think resonate with you, which you're interested in. So choose themes that, that um, are appropriate for what you do. I think the other thing that that offers, this breadth and scope, uh, is diversification. So from an investment perspective, that's quite appealing to have 
in essence, a, a highly diversified portfolio. Um, uh, the, the other sort of aspect, I believe, within our fund that's appealing to investors specifically is really to do with uh, responsible lending. Um, and so uh, the investors want to see that the way that their money is deployed is highly responsible in terms of impact investing and inclusive microfinance. What we do specifically, I think, that appeals to them in that regard is it's very hands-on. So for a small two billion fund, uh, a two billion euro fund headquartered out of Luxembourg, investing in Silk Road countries, we have 3,400 employees on the ground through those markets we lend into. So it's a very highly controlled, highly managed process, but gives those investors comfort that when they're investing into this impact area, that they're investing in a very responsible way, so that the, the lending is highly controlled and highly responsible. So there is size and there is track record and there are investors, but yet um, there are still challenges, right? And when looking at the data, we see that there are still um, 1.7 billion people who don't have access properly to financial services. And are, some are completely excluded, actually, from uh, financial services. And we all know that financing uh, small and medium enterprises is a particular challenge. So how can we together unlock these opportunities and uh, today, there are new business models, including fintech. Uh, really, you have alluded to that already. Uh, I'd like to hear from, from Charles, right? Uh, what's his view, and particularly on your largest market, which is China? Yeah, I think uh, when you talk about impact, as an investor, when money leaves your hand and creating impact, where the impact is going to get created? How many layers of underlines you have to go through before the impact? So the you know, it, Today, obviously, the, most of the investors looking at the underlying listed companies uh, in the public market, uh, all larger companies that uh, are able to do traditional debt and equity. But I think uh, China today presents everybody with a golden opportunity to be massively penetrating into the real economy because now we are able to make investment and collect returns literally every day on a daily basis at the shop level businesses and with a very, very small businesses. When you are able to make investment into that granularity, into that individual transparency, into that daily and uh, generated you know, in, and, you know, uh, information and data, then investing can be directly penetrating all the way to the veins of the blood system and rather than being absorbed and prevented. So impact investing in the end China is likely going to be able to present to the you know, invest, investing universe and globally uh, ability to literally put money into the real economic activities. For example, we, you know, we obviously pioneer a new market. So today, you know, we invested in hair you know, saloons, uh, you know, hundreds of them. And uh, we want to encourage employment of handicapped people. And there are a lot of uh, deaf or hearing challenged uh, girls and boys who are washing people's hair. And uh, we actually are going to say that if you, if you have such employee, not only the business is extremely popular because everybody wanted to go to a hair salon and be able to be serviced by one of those individuals, not only because they wanted to be charitable and doing good things, but also it's quiet, right? You don't have to talk to the person washing your hair. And, uh, and so we encourage that. You're able to literally say, anybody who have two persons, handicapped person in, in employed, we're gonna potentially have a potentially investment uh, points rebate. So when you are able to generate economic returns on investment at granular level, then we are talking about creating potential opportunities for us to Im impact directly investing in millions of underlines rather than just thousands of underlines. So that's a very interesting insight, right? Granularity of financial inclusion, which definitely explain uh, why it has built such a successful track record. And I'd like to turn to Rally, because Rally, you alluded already to your investment into fintechs and also how you drive a change. Uh, through this particular mandate and how Genderlands actually adds to your investment. Would you comment on, on that? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, maybe I'll start with, with a statistic. I mean, microfinance has been around for a long time, but still, I think in 2017, IFC um, estimated that in South and Southeast Asia, out of the 64 million MSMEs, about half of them are still underbanked or unbanked. So microfinance can only go as far um, in closing that gap. And we've seen that with the advances of technology, predictive algorithms, you know, you can start addressing some of the challenges that traditional microfinance cannot. Um, why is it so difficult for MSMEs to access loans? Lack of collateral, usually. Um, for women, it's even harder because they typically don't own property or cultural norms prevent them from taking a loan unless there's a male co-signer. All of those things um, with, with particularly mobile penetration as well as digital payment systems, you have this whole new world opening up as a possibility to address these challenges. Now, that being said, we should be perhaps a little bit careful about getting overexcited because there are a lot of fintech models out there that perhaps I wouldn't call impact. Um, you know, plethora of buy now, pay later, uh, consumer products uh, cater to people who maybe cannot afford them. So, uh, you know, microfinance went through this kind of period of what are responsible lending practices and regulation caught up, and it's now kind of a plain vanilla asset class. I think fintech is still very much in the early stages uh, of that, and I think regulators need to catch up. Um, and so for us, what's really important is then who do we partner with as far as, you know, wholesalers who do equity or debt investments into fintechs? And are these investors keeping those fintechs accountable and, and keeping them according to, to the standards of, of responsible lending? Um, as far as product innovation, innovation and gender, I would say from what we've seen from our investments um, is it, it's a very, I guess, male-dominated sector. Very few fintech founders for whatever reason, are, are, are women. Um, and that also trickles down and reflect, reflects into the senior management. And that reflects into how the products are structured. And so what we try to do is, is kind of uncover some of those things, understand why that is, and, and push some of our partners to, to make those incremental changes and give them yeah, advisory services, technical assistance to look in their products and see, okay, what are you missing out of in your consu consumer segments by not looking at the gender aspects of, of the products that, that, that you... And I can give you an example around, you know, gender disaggregated repayment rates. Typically, women do repay better. We know this from microfinance. It is true in fintech products as well, but they lack collateral. So can you use some of that data to predict repayment behaviors and adjust loan sizes and products um, to solve for that and... Um, create products for women that actually serve their purpose. Um, so it's still in the very beginning stages, I would say, that whole fintech journey and, and a lot to sift through in terms of what's out there and what's truly impact. No, that's very inspiring. And I think we all agree that uh, financial inclusion, either being microfinance institution or the new business model, are actually a huge investment opportunity. I think you mentioned plain vanilla. It's a plain vanilla opportunity. Uh, and, and still, it's not fully acknowledged or recognized um, in, in Asia in particular, where it's still um, picking up uh, as an investment opportunity. So what would you say is needed today to really unleash the potential of uh, impact investment in financial inclusion? Maybe starting with Charles. I'm not sure I got the question. Um, what, what do you think should be said or acknowledged to attract more investors in this sector? Yeah, I think for, the first thing is look at the word impact investing is the word investing. I think it's quite important for us to note that microfinance in its original form and history is largely credit, is largely fixed income. And uh, I would argue that for small and micro businesses, Credit is probably the wrong product because individually they are really unbankable because of the risk and because of the lack of collateral. And also when your return is fixed, which means that all you can do is to try to reduce the NPL to manage on the risk side, which means that the business cannot scale. When you scale, NPL is going to rise and then it's going to eat away at the fixed cost or fixed returns. So impact investing of microfinance 
really we need to think from the lens of investing rather than credit. So therefore, in our company, in our new model, we have created a capital that is the best for the little guy. Because if the shop doesn't work out, they don't have to pay. So we share the downside risk. But on the other hand, if the shop is doing really well, we don't have to take everything upstairs either. It's sort of a limited, un not uncapped returns. But investing is really the most important. That is, is really putting money in there so that hopefully you are winning enough on the upside to offset the in inevitable loss you will have to incur when you come to small businesses. So it's not about reducing that to zero or reducing that to 2%, in which case that you can never help enough people. But if you think you are able to use the law of big numbers and to be able to win enough on the upside, then you will absolutely accept that when you are investing in small businesses, it will fail, but hopefully on a scale, on a law of big numbers, that you will always come out on top simply because the volatility of the little guys um, you know, as an aggregating a portfolio is actually very low. Because imagine when we put our own money to open a restaurant, a hair salon, an auto mechanic, or a laundry mat, if we don't get our money back in about 15 months or 18 months, nobody will make that investment. Doesn't mean that if you do invest, you will get that money back that soon, but the business nature is such, it's a good business. That's why people put their personal money and personal borrowings into it. But individually, they're not uninvest they're uninvestable, unbankable. But if you're able to find a way to deploy on scale, like we have done 4,000 shops now. So despite last year's rolling COVID restrictions, we have made out very, very nicely. But in the end, you've got to do a very big numbers, but very granular you know, uh, in nature, and that they are fully diversified, you know, and that ultimately is how you are able to succeed in investing. Only when you are succeed in investing, you can do impact. If you're already dead, there's no impact. The impact is on you. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very fair answer. Stephanie, you are in touch with the investors, so what do you tell them? Yeah, no, so I think actually like Charles, completely captures like the granular aspect of microfinance and practice. I, I think from what I can try to bring add to that would be the more macro perspective. And I think to that, it's really looking at, you know, financial inclusion, not, not just as a standalone investment type, but really in an impact investing itself. As Charles said, you know, it's all about scalability. We need to demonstrate that uh, impact investing can be commercial and can be scalable. And for that, we're really lacking, um, you know, a, a coherent ecosystem in Asia still. So it's still a little bit patchy. Whereas like, if you look at in Europe, um, the development of impact investing as a movement is not a standalone movement. It coincided, you know, it accelerated alongside strategic philanthropy where, you know, you're making matters of the heart more logical. And, and on, the other, on the other hand, you also have sustainable investing where you're making investment low matches of the head a bit more heartfelt. And what it is at the moment is that in, in Asia, these are still very disparate. We don't really have strategic philanthropy at scale. We don't have sustainable investing at scale. Sustainable investing in Asia is a single digit penetration compared to two thirds of the market in Europe, for example. We really need to get the whole ecosystem up in order to sufficiently de-risk and bring scale to the space. So I think right now we a lot of burden is you know really on individuals, on next gens, you know, to champion impact investing. But that actually is not it shouldn't necessarily be their burden. It's really, you know, the next big thing is for us as, um, you know, ecosystem players, as wealth advisors, like, you know, from my perspective, to, to really um, drive that commercialization and drive the scale and, um, and an opportunity set such that our investors can be convinced that they don't need, they're not putting anything at risk by deploying money towards impact. And that basically is our MO. <laughs> You bring actually a very important point, which is uh, transparency, uh, accountability. And of course, to get that, you need data. And actually, it brings me to my, uh, it's a great segue, actually, to my next question. Um, and, and we know that there is an increased sophistication in the use of uh, data and metrics. 
Um, and, and the GIN, the Global Impact Investment Network, has actually played a huge role in developing uh, harmonized metrics and uh, eventually uh, benchmark. Um, we have also released publications such as um, uh, Understanding Impact uh, Performance with Financial Inclusion Investment. Um, and you are all seasoned impact investors, so I'd like to know actually how you use impact data uh, for your uh, investment process, and maybe starting with uh, Rally. Yeah, sure. Um, so we have something called theory of change. Um, maybe it's more of a government term, but we for ourselves have defined what is it that we want to achieve as, as an LP in our GPs. And for us, that's primarily achieved through, through influencing, right, and, and being a role model. Um, and so we start very early in the investment process to ask the, the questions around ESG, gender, and impact. Actually, alongside our investment memos, we produce something called ESGI gap analysis. The I stands for impact. And so that allows us then to define ESGI action plans and embed those into our legal agreements and then over time monitor performance. Um, and then of course we, we follow the Iris Plus metrics. We do annual surveys for our GPs, general partners. Um, we collect information from their portfolio companies, but data is only as good as how, how you use it, right? So what do we do after it is, is we analyze it and we do what we call, I guess, impact management and we give back to our GPs. So what value add can we bring? We can compare them to the 30 others in our portfolio. We can compare them to, you know, industry benchmarks, for example, and showcase, and this is where you're doing well, this is where, where you could improve. And we have that sort of unique vantage point because we, we have GPs across global emerging markets, whereas, you know, if you're a single GP, you sit in one country or, or a couple, and so you don't have that benefit of comparison. That's, so that's how we, we try to balance, you know, keeping our partners accountable with always asking ourselves, how can we add value as an LP? And also impact investing is a very quickly evolving field, right? I mean, climate is now a huge topic, TCFD regulation. It wasn't the case two, three, four years ago. And our partners, they're focused on their portfolio companies, right? Um, so they cannot perhaps stay as abreast on these developments as we can. So it's our duty as an investor um, to yeah, keep them abreast of, of this and, and help them navigate these kind of evolving landscapes. Danny, does it echo with your own practice? Yeah, that resonates as well in terms of how we manage our portfolio. <clears throat> in essence, it's a, it's a lending portfolio. So at any one time, we have two to 300,000 loans. Um, these are microfinance loans. Um, so our whole portfolio construction, if you like, the investment approach to build that portfolio is is pretty much aligned with impact-related goals and measures and metrics. And so that's the number of loans, the number of employees within these companies, diversification by country, by industry sector, um, a range of measures. I think in addition to that, certainly we look at things like the, through the gender lens. So how many of these loans are going to, <coughs> excuse me, women entrepreneurs? Um, we look at the way in which our employee workforce on the ground is doing non-financial support for these businesses as well. In essence, these business credit officers are really business coaches for these entrepreneurs. <clears throat> and our, our marketing, if you like, our brand within these local developing market communities is very much based around, are we a good partner to work with to develop these businesses within these developing markets? So all of these things I think are integral um, in terms of developing a good investment portfolio from an investment perspective align very well with the impact-related outcomes that, that we're achieving through that as well. And Stephanie, you are an early adopter of Iris Plus and um, uh, also of uh, OPIN, of the operating principle. So how do you use those uh, data in your own process? Yeah, so I would say like there are three layers of consideration. So the first is, um, of course, you know, as again, you know, like Riley said, as an asset allocator and an LP, um, we do try and uh, like influence um, our GPs and the funds on our platform to try and um, strive for data standardization um, to guide them towards, you know, metrics such as RS Plus um, and uh, IFC operating principles has been, you know, a requirement, like a prerequisite for, for many years now. So we, we're also very um, happy to see that it's been integrated in the gen. 
Um, so that, that's the first layer, you know, as an asset allocator. And then, you know, at, uh, at, at you know, to facing our clients, we're also trying to make more and more data available and transparent to our client base. But along with that, we're also trying to give, um, you know, provide a lot of education to our distribution, both like, you know, internally as well as externally facing our clients so that they can understand the data better that they're actually seeing. And I think the final point, um, it also kind of touches on how UBS works with Jin, for example. Like we're on the investor council, but we also sit, um, you know, on the boards and related investor council for other entities like, you know, investment um, impact management project and like, you know, SASB. And, and, and for that, you know, we really think that, you know, as an industry player, like we have um, almost $300 billion in group assets related to sustainable and impact. And there we're really trying to exert our influence to lobby for greater data standardization amongst the industry as well. So this is probably how we think of it, like across the three layers and combined is, is hopefully contributing to like a more transparent investment ecosystem for impact. So basically it's about transparency and it's about communication with your internal stakeholders and also your clients, right? And no data, no proven impact, right? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, look, we still have two or three minutes. So I st I'd like actually to ask you in maybe one sentence, what, you, what would be your call for action for the audience we have today, maybe starting with Charles. I don't think I have a, the chance to answer the data issue yet. Do you okay. mind if I can do it? No, we still have okay. credit yeah. time. So. I think, I think uh, it is extremely important to make sure the data uh, is granular, is transparent. And now that we are able to do daily, so we have invested in 4,000 shops uh, throughout China today, 140 cities. We're going to hit 30,000 this year. If you look at the 15 months data, only this very short history, you are able to see every day what's going on. We have this index about for every 1,000 investment, how much cash we're receiving every day. So average is 1.52. But Monday, no, Sunday is the peak. Tuesday is the valley every day. National holiday is 2 yuan, more than 2 yuan on that day because everybody out spending. On Chinese New Year's Eve, the lowest because everybody stayed home. Very you know, intuitive. But on Chinese New Year's Eve, our um, convenience store index hit 2.2 yuan because everybody have to do last minute shopping. And if you look at our pharmacy, over that entire COVID period, our pharmacy is doing so well. And then everybody recovered in December. It drops down big time. And then it went up big time again before we even know it. It turned out to be uh, influenza is back. So we are able to truly see, and also you only invest in Shanghai, 8%. If you only invest in Guangdong, 32%. If you only invest in, in cultural activities like a theaters and gym, you lose 50% of your value. But if you only invest in retail during COVID, it went up big time. So it is the daily granularity of that data, create the transparency that give you the tools to do impact investing at a very granular level. No, that's actually a very interesting message, right? It's about measuring the positive impact, but it has also consequences on risk mitigation. That's what you are, you are describing. No, great. So now coming to my last question, your call for action for the audience. Call, call for action, what would it be? What action? Yes. What is your call? Your, huh? your call for action. I'm not sure. <laughs> More investment I, in, in our space. Let them do it. Yeah. I, I actually think there's this pervasive um, view growing within the market about the need for people to actually take action on impact investment. And then, so I see it a lot. I think that the stakeholders of the investors are increasingly looking for those investors to take action. Um, and so the challenge then really is for those investors to think, what are those things that resonate with my stakeholders? And the stakeholders are those people that the past success of the company, entity, the family office, whatever, and the future success depends on. Um, so I think listening to, to what these stakeholders are increasingly saying, increasingly vocally, um, that there's a compelling call to action to do something on impact. The challenge then becomes what is most important for me and for my stakeholders. Um, and I think we've talked about inclusive microfinance. It's a very big space. 
more broadly, the impact investment universe is very appealing and very attractive. Um, there's lots of opportunities, I think, that you can find to tailor investment opportunities to your uh, goals, your values, your stakeholder uh, messages. So I think that's, that's the call to action. Ready? Yeah, we recently had our strategic retreat and we defined this big, audacious and hairy goal, how we imagine the future to be in 10, 20 years. And what we came up is impact investments in every portfolio and democratizing impact investing knowledge. And so my call to action would be start now, start today. It is. It can be an overwhelming field if you're completely new to it and stepping in with all the acronyms and all the different themes. But the beauty of, of it is you can pick and choose. You don't have to do everything. You can pick one impact theme to, to focus on. But as I think the previous panel mentioned, you know, we need all hands on deck, whether it's climate or gender or agriculture or financial inclusion. Take your pick, but start today. So start the journey. That's basically your message. Stephanie? Um, so also aligned to something that was also um, mentioned in the previous two panels, but just to reiterate that don't let perfection get in the way of progress. Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of learning by doing. It's the most effective and fun way to learn. So um, it is very complicated. It's not perfect. It's very nascent. But please give impact investing a chance, whether it's your personal portfolio or your work or even just your dinner conversations. Wonderful. And I think that will be all for today. Could I, could I have that uh, one you have, So please, Sorry. now you know. You know because what I is just, your I just learn. I just learn. Let's circle back okay. to Okay, just a word. China is already cashless. In a cashless society, there are so many ways to do so many things differently. And think about what it will do to Wall Street. And we will be investing differently in a cashless society. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maud, yeah, and all the panelists for such an exciting uh, panel discussion. Yes, I, I think, yeah, uh, we just want to thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, but you, you're welcome to stay. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, our upcoming uh, panel discussion is very exciting. It's talk about the next generation of impact investing leaders, how they step up their game to uh, drive changes. It is my pleasure to welcome Amy, uh, uh, Amy Lo, uh, co-head of Wealth Management Asia Pacific, UBS Global Wealth Management, and head and chief executive of UBS Hong Kong, along with her distinguished panelists to take the stage. So I'll leave you, Amy, uh, to introduce your distinguished panelists. Okay, thank you so much. A very warm welcome to the next generation of impact investing leaders. Uh, maybe let me first introduce uh, the panelists. Poman Law, the founding managing partner of Alpha Trail Capital. Uh, Michael, uh, director of sustainability New World. And Eric, uh, the CEO of uh, Happiness Capital. I'm very impressed by your name card. So colorful and so happy. And Andrew, the associate director for Sino Group. So thank you so much for joining me. Maybe before we start, if I may also spare a few minutes to share some number with you uh, because we publish the billionaire report every year and last year uh, when we published uh, the UBS billionaire ambitions report I'm so encouraged to see the number because 95 percent of the billionaire said they should use the wealth and all the resources to tackle the global uh, challenges so that's one and also 50% of the billionaire also want to tackle these global challenges for the next generation. Uh, so that, that's um, also speak, uh, they all want to make a positive impact on the society there, and that's their priority. That, that's uh, slide number one. Then the second message is that, then we ask them, what are the key area that they will be interested in? And so you can tell <clears throat> from the chart here, is the smart agriculture, the economic development, property elevation, as well as the clean water. So that's the feedback we got from all the um, billionaire, uh, uh, out of the billionaire report. So you can tell, basically, the impact investing, this topic is also at the center of um, all these investors and um, the top families around the globe. 
And then um, also the next slide, UBS, uh, we have a long track record uh, in both sustainable investing as well as also impact investing. Uh, again, the numbers speak for itself because if I look at in 2021, by end of 2021, we have 29 billion in impact investing. And if I look at the CACA growth, we are talking about 45%. And so it shows that all the investors are interested and they put money where their mouth is. So that's also another very encouraging uh, information to share here. Okay, so now back to the forum here. Perhaps our first question to Bowman. Uh, your group is mainly in the hotel and also in the property sector. So what really inspired you to go to impact investing and how's the journey so far? Share with us here. I'd say actually uh, my dogs inspired me. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a single mother of a dozen poodles. So I'm an animal lover. Um, so obviously I care a lot for nature, uh, for the world. Uh, I study psychology back at university. I've always cared um, for the next generation, wanting to do my best for their holistic well-being. But I joined my family business instead. And yet I never lost that uh, uh, sen sense of purpose. So I really tried to instill sustainability across all our business operations and corporate initiatives. Um, back in 2010, so that's 13 years ago, we actually launched the first carbon neutral hotel in Hong Kong called iClub. So that's kind of way before we all started talking about ESG and sustainability, like buzzwords. Um, and since then, we have been investing heavily into green tech, especially prop tech. And what's most encouraging is that we find that companies that deliver impact actually outperform the rest of our portfolio. So these companies are actually successful because of the impact they deliver rather than in spite of. So I think up to this day, there's still quite a bit of a misconception out there that we need to somehow compromise returns when I, we do I can good. confirm that kind of myth. And, yes, uh, it's a myth. <laughs> so we are all here to do When we talk to some of the clients, they say, oh, but uh, you take care of our investment. I do my own right. charity. Yeah, I don't exactly. want to compromise any return. Right. So now we are talking about the next wave, uh, next trend in philanthropy. Um, and we actually find that actually it's possible to do well by doing good. Um, and because of this myth, I feel that there's a need um, to really establish a platform so that we can join forces together with like-minded partners to fix these problems because we all live in a huge world with complex problems, urgent challenges uh, that require collaboration to solve. Um, so that's the reason, why I, the rationale behind uh, you started your own uh, impact investing fund, Alpha yes. Trail Capital. Yes, yes. So obviously it was much easier to, to, to use our own capital. It was quicker, it was easy. I have, must have met hundreds of um, potential investors in the past years. Never some Fundraising is just never something I've ever done before. And yet I feel like um, I enjoy this because I'm, an, I, I'm a champion of sustainable finance. I'm an evangelist for impact investing. And I truly believe in purpose-driven business uh, because in all the founders that I've met, those that start with why, those who really want to deliver impact and solve problems, those are the ones that actually can hit the home run. And that is why I've called my fund Alpha Trio because ESG need not be just risk mitigating. It can be alpha generating. Um, and Trio is the triple bottom line we, because we truly believe that the next wave of unicorns should be green tech companies that deliver disruptive innovative solutions for our most pressing problems. I can feel the passion. Thank you so much, uh, Bowman. Uh, Michael, turn to you. What does impact investing mean to you? And also, particularly, you work for a listed com company. So how do you strike the balance between accountability and responsibility to the shareholder that need to align uh, to the value of the group versus also looking at and uh, considering some of the impact investing opportunity? Uh, that's a big question. <clears throat> uh, look, I, I work for an organization called New World, a Hong Kong listed 
real estate uh, uh, led investment organization. We cover everything from uh, infrastructure and hotels and entertainment right the way through to life insurance and healthcare. So with that broad remit, with the places that our organization needs to create, you know, fundamentally we need a thriving society, we need a vibrant local economy, and we do need a healthy planet. You know, building parts of cities doesn't actually happen overnight. And if these places don't fundamentally thrive, then your business will not thrive. So it's ingrained in fundamental with regards to the places you create. Also, impact investing uh, we see as a bit of a continuum from broadly responsible investment. You know, when you do look at all these factors in how you measure value from your organisation, impact investing is really just bringing another level of discipline in how you measure and how you target these particular outcomes and where you're trying to focus. And, and, and so it's fundamental that, you know, your organisation is focused on these. So how, how do we make it work? You know, it's important that when you are investing in this space, you align it to your core business and particularly where you can add value, you know, where your organisation can add material value. Because there are a lot of environmental and social challenges in the world and it's one thing to go trying to change something on the other side of the world, whereas maybe you do want to start in the area or region or your organisation's area of expertise and bring that to the table as part of your investment philosophy. You know, secondly, you want to build clear investment frameworks and you want to make them tr transparent. You can see ours online, you can see how we're investing these funds and where we're putting this money. Um, and then you want to align your finance with it and you want to be transparent on your progress and you want to, you know, get an independent view on what you're doing because it is a learning journey. And I, but I think that's fundamental that you are bringing the capability of the organisation and your investors and your stakeholders and your tenants and your customers with you um, because I think we're all very quickly learning and it was mentioned uh, uh, earlier on, you know, this has to be a collaborative process because there is no good us all operating in a bubble because the earth isn't a bubble. So, uh, but I, I can imagine the challenge because you have so many uh, different key stakeholders to manage, right? And uh, on top, you also need to align some of the corporate uh, kind of value, huh? Uh, look, <laughs> so, absolutely, but it's, but it's really, you know, I, I think there's a bit of an epiphany happening that everyone has been focused on this very much in, in where they can add value. But then we're starting to see some of our biggest tenants and our biggest JV partners and our biggest investors going, well, actually, we're committed to net zero too. Uh, we operate where you do. We're tenants in your places or we're partners with you in KTSP. Uh, maybe we should actually try and drive the same outcome together. And I think that's a real turning point where I think that people are starting to kind of find common ground on these not just aspirational goals, but actually hard driven action. And that's, I think, where you're starting to see this finance really, you know, get a grip. And our investors are actually acknowledging that. And, you know, as we talk to various funds uh, and analysts as well. Yep, thank you. Hey, Eric, um, I know you invest in a lot of company that deliver um, financial return as well as happiness return. Tell us, what, what's happiness return? And also, in the process, how you assess uh, the company delivering both? Right. <clears throat> so, uh, just let me introduce uh, Happiness Capital because uh, everyone is interested in the name. So, uh, Happiness Capital is uh, a global venture capital firm under the uh, Lee Kum Kee Group. And uh, we're based in Hong Kong, but we are global. And uh, um, we focus on four investment areas, sustainable environment, uh, sustainable food systems, um, health and trust. And uh, our, most of our portfolio companies are in the US, uh, UK, Europe, Israel, China, and Japan. Um, and uh, about eight years ago, um, the, the Lee Kum Kee family actually thought about like creating a lot of things around happiness. Um, and so how do we start? And so they make a donation to the uh, um, Harvard School of Public Health to create the Lee Kum Sheng Center for Health and Happiness. Uh, to study like what makes people happy, um, how to convey what the messages. What makes people happy then? Well, it's actually it's very personal, and uh, that, that, now you're laughing. So, what makes so you, you laugh? You make everybody you probably, like, happy. Different now. reasons. 
And, uh, and of course, like, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of you know, researchers would say like relationships and also purpose of life would uh, also make you happy. But uh, when you think about next generation, the clean environment, clean air that you breathe, clean water that you drink, um, food security, all these also, like, also um, cause people to concern about the future. Um, so um, based on the Harvard study, we, uh, we work with three uh, impact investment uh, experts, uh, Jet Emerson, SVT, and um, 60 Decibels, to create the concept of happiness return. So basically, for every portfolio company, we um, identify all the stakeholders. The stakeholders should be the, the customers, the community, the next generation, and even planet Earth or even space. Um, and uh, for each stakeholder, we will identify the condition for happiness, which is based on OECD's uh, Better Life Index, and also the experience of happiness, which is based on uh, the PERMA model, which is more about mental health. Um, and then we aggregate all the scores together and create the happiness return for the entire portfolio. And if you, uh, I heard a speaker talk about blended um, investments or blended value. So we also adapt the same approach. So we call it integrated return. So, so when you have a capitalist return times the uh, financial return, like a TVPI, then we you know, get the, uh, the integrated return for the entire portfolio. So uh, we've been doing this for the last three years and the latest score from our um, portfolio companies uh, are scored 1.41. That means that every dollar we put in, we create 41% more happiness to the world. And it's all done by uh, third party assessors, not by ourselves. And at the same time, we also ask these companies, are they happy with us? <laughs> are we bringing any value? And uh, do we walk the talk? And uh, we get assessment from, for ourselves as well, whether we're doing well. So, uh, so it's like a two-way thing. And uh, we created portfolio companies that tackle most of the, uh, the SDGs, <laughs> the seven SDGs. I think we cover about two thirds of them. Uh, and we have more than 60 companies, uh, direct investment in the pocket, and 16 funds uh, globally. So uh, that's how we, uh, we all started with happiness. Yeah. Oh, so quite a systematic kind of approach, huh? You're yeah, adopting. Yeah, because uh, I think a lot of people, who, even some family office would like to start impact investment, but they keep asking, how do we measure the impact, right? Uh, if we put in like 10 million, 100 million, 20, uh, 200 million, how much we're getting um, impact? Uh, of course, uh, financial return to us is very important. So, uh, in fact, we aim for both very high financial return and very high uh, happiness return in our portfolio. And uh, in, in the Lee Key family, they have uh, the Lee Key Foundation that is uh, responsible for more the uh, philanthropy works. So we sometimes work with them how to actually uh, help each other. I will come back to all of you about the performance later on. Huh? And um, so... Now, Andrew, um, I'm sure you've been shown a lot of uh, opportunity, all this kind of impact investing opportunity, left and right. So how do you prioritize and select um, this kind of investment that will also need to consider uh, aligning with the co uh, corporate kind of value? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I work for Sino Group, a local developer. We have footprints in uh, basically many Hong Kong, Singapore, and also overseas, but, but mainly concentrating in Hong Kong, Singapore, where basically property developer groups similar to New World. Um, and uh, so for us, uh, it is probably primarily focusing on technology that would enable our assets to be of better value uh, in terms of sustainability. Uh, so we do focus a lot on property technology, green technology. But the other side of things, we're not so much in the happiness but we're very much into wellness. We believe in wellness of community we serve, community we sell the asset to. But in that, the family kind of define wellness also include wellness of human being. So uh, for, for us, uh, looking at technology innovation ventures that come through, we, we, we also look at med tech technology, technology that could help betterment of mankind uh, but not only in the well off society, but technology that could improve mankind in the less well off society. So things like cancer genomics and some med tech technology that could help uh, in helping make people healthier, even in less well off community. Not so much just in Hong Kong. So that's the two sides of it. So uh, pretty much for us, we focus on the value of the group, but also the family plays a very key role in deciding which direction we go because it's about the family values. And they all believe, as 
your slide says, the billionaire look at how they can use their wealth to betterment of the next generation, their next generation, and next generation of the community, and in, in to doing something good for the society. So you also have a heavy kind of family participation yes. in the process as well. I yes. think that's good. Huh? Is it more from the next generation? Yes, basically mm -hmm. the next generation, and I guess we get a lot of referral, but uh, so my role, I bring a lot of innovation, new ideas coming through, but we look at the impact, uh, probably not so much the happiness impact, but we are seeing, you know, uh, as the other speaker saying, return on investment is very important. And that's a very hard one to do because if you look at uh, some of the sustainability technology and, and uh, blockchain technology, what impact? I mean, how, does, how, how can it be measured? Are those practical, are those readily applicable right now? But I guess we need to consider a lot of grounds and dimension to see how they can impact the business but also, I think a lot of it we're taking into account the wellness part of it is, does it make us better? I mean, for example, does the technology elevate our staff of stress and the, the you know, our ability to retain staff to provide a better environment for our, our staff and also for our customer? I think those also come into the decision-making process. And uh, actually, that, that echoed very well um, our billionaire report finding as well. I, especially, I think in Asia, we've been witnessing the wealth transfer from one generation to another with the next generation coming into the picture. I, I have also seen and witnessed uh, the increasing interest in sustainable investing and also uh, impact investing, which is a really encouraging sign. Um, perhaps a question to all of you, as I said, now, with um, all the different investment, how's the performance, the financial performance, other than um, the happiness return and the social return? So what was, what's the, the performance? So yeah, far? maybe I can start. I mean, for us, we are, we're early into the journey, but we are definitely into the journey. And for that, I mean, it's always a balance between the financial return, but we know a lot of this venture we're looking into will probably generate return much longer than a typical uh, return, financial return only mentality. So we, we kind of will take a longer term perspective to say, maybe it's not the next three to five years, maybe it's the five to seven years or five to 10 years. I guess a balance needs to be taken, but for professional managers in, in this field, it's always very difficult to balance between the two because you know financial return is basically on your back, but you know impact, impact, but how do you, you know, I love to, you know, be able to share the happiness impact, but it, we, we don't have a wellness impact, but some, I, I guess a balance needs to be taken between the two aspects. So it's, it's a very tough one to, to administer. Eric? Yeah, so uh, first of all, happiness capital is evergreen. We are not really a fund, so we, we invest on balance sheet, um, but we also benchmark again, um, ourselves against the global VC um, performance benchmark. So we are always in the top quartile of the, uh, the global benchmark. And uh, most of the uh, exits that we have so far, um, we have 100% IOR. Oh, so, uh, so it's just uh, very impressive. And, and this, our belief uh, is to, in the long term, we prove that actually companies with a great mission should actually outperform the others and create both a high financial return and high happiness return to the whole world. So um, that, that's uh, our goal in the long term. 20, 30 years later, when we come back to this stage, we should have some more data to share with you like over maybe 100,000 companies, what do they perform? Do they give you more happiness at the, at the same time, like the return, high financial return to their um, shareholders? You know? I am confident yeah. that um, we will have an even better number to show as times goes by. Yeah? Uh, and Michael, anything you want to add? Uh, in terms of our, our performance, look, uh, for those of you familiar with our organisation, you know, we have uh, made concerted efforts to invest heavily uh, in this space in terms of raising capital as well. Uh, last year, we were the first corporate to raise US-denominated social and green dual tranche bonds of totaling US $700 million. If you have a look uh, a, a bit about our company, where we're investing these kind of projects and investments, uh, the Build for Good, which is a social housing project that we're working on uh, about donating land and creating affordable housing to tackle some of these issues in Hong Kong. 
with projects like this, you are, and as well as the state theatre re refurbishment at North Point, these are projects where we are considering much greater outcomes rather than the pure financial returns. You know, we are looking at the, the cultural significance and the value of identity that the state theatre presents and refurbishing that. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not changing the fundamentals and what that really means to society. And we're also looking at the um, social housing for good. You know, that isn't our core business, but we do see that as a fundamental issue that it would be remiss not to actually try and pilot that and to tackle it. And that's why we've, we've put our money where our mouth is on those things. Um, and then you look more broadly at other type of social projects like the Kaitak Sports Park and the kind of partnerships we're about to create around trying to elevate health literacy in Hong Kong and the connection between sports, recreation, fitness and, and wellbeing um, right across to, you know, a, a healthcare and life insurance business. But fundamentally, you know, people's value of their health and their mental well-being after the last few years has never been more paramount in society. Uh, and these aren't just nice to have. This is, this is affecting your own employees as much as it's affecting the community. So, you know, as, as I mentioned before, we, we're working hard. It's a learning journey, no doubt. You know, some of these investments mightn't deliver everything you want, you know, straight away. But, but how do you measure if we are able to crack an affordable housing pilot that can stack up over time, or it leads to the next model and the next model, then it's, it's contributed far greater returns than purely financial. So, you know, look forward to updating everyone on those kinds of initiatives um, and, you know, ensure that we're sort of transparent on how we update. Yeah, I can certainly see the group's uh, commitment in this space. Um, so, thank you. Pomona, anything right. you want to add? So, um, from our business point of view, iClub, uh, the first carbon neutral hotel brand in Hong Kong, um, so that has done very well. We, since 2010, we have opened another six iClubs, and I would say they are among one of the most profitable hotels in town. And um, in fact, they remain profitable during COVID. So it is a resilient model, um, and that proves that you know we can do well by doing good. And for our investments, I'm proud to say that around 40 some investments, um, none of them has gone down to zero. Um, so none of them has died. Uh, on the average, uh, it was above, uh, well, well above uh, 40. And now it's about 20 some 30. So of course, you know, there, there are fluctuations. But I would say that, you know, the stars are aligned for impact investing. Um, I think, you know, 10 years ago, it'd be difficult to find unicorns. But these days, we have over uh, 70 countries committing to net zero. So with this pledge, technology is the only way that can solve these problems and accelerate the transition. So when a technology company actually can help with the transition, can help decarbonize operations, uh, naturally, they will be uh, delivering outsized returns. So we are very confident that going forward, the returns will be even better. Good. Maybe um, a final question before we go to the rapid fire question. Um, for the audience uh, in this forum, as well as for some of the early investors who want to get into this space, what's your advice? Eric? Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't well, wait. <laughs> yeah, jump into it. Don't wait for Learn perfection, from it as and, uh, Stephanie and get some more friends, earlier. like in uh, in this kind of audience, and every friend has uh, some learning to share. And yep. uh, yeah, if you don't start, you you're always you know, stuck there. And oh, should I? Should I not? Should I? Should I not? But uh, once you you get going, you have more partners, you have more friends, and you learn more. Um, say, for example, we uh, we we started out with. Um, Food, sustainable food, and then now we are in the space, and uh, and we even like with uh, net carbon, we uh, we have companies in in Finland and the United States actually can convert low CO two into food. So not only like carbon neutral, we are actually taking our carbon to make something useful for human beings. Um, so if you if you don't start it, then people don't come to you. And uh, now we have a constant deal flow every day. Um, so we can actually um, select you know, better deals, and if you don't start, then you don't, you get nothing. <laughs> Just do it, huh? Yeah, similar. Uh, I think we we COVID. I think in the current economic circumstance, the ticket size gets smaller, people are, are tighter. But I think in this sphere, uh, is partnership. 
is everybody coming together, sharing, learning from one another, and co-investing. And the more you get in, the more you're finding more. So it's, it's you know, get on with it, and then you'll be in it. Well, in all this together. And once you start, actually, you'll find a lot of like-minded kind of investor, and that formed the partnership because uh, the world problem is too big for any single individual or investor or corporate to solve. It's the partnership. Okay, perhaps um, let me go to uh, some of the rapid fire question. If I can start, um, no, just short answer, 10 seconds, and uh, we go one by one. What's the most important SDG goal for you? It's definitely SDG 13, climate action, because there is no time to be lost, and there's no plan B, because there's no planet B. I would say, um, more broadly speaking, environment, because when we look around the building you're in, the clothes you're wearing, the food you're eating, how you get he from here and how you get home, it's all provided by one thing, which is the planet. And then without one, all this is talk, so. Eric? Uh, with our group's uh, business philosophy, we won't miss anything. So all seven teams are important <laughs> to us. Oh, come on. Uh, uh, our existing portfolio already covered two thirds, so why not the, uh, the remaining third too, right? So. Oh, so that really showed the kind of commitment you guys have. Yeah, I'll, and I'll go for 13 too. Um, the climate action. I think that's something that we're all in this climate action together. Mm -hmm. Next question. What, what's the biggest challenge for impact investing? I think we really need to internalize the belief that we can do well by doing good. I think there's a lot of um, words, but we need to translate them into actions. And um, I also think that we have to be selective when we invest because... Uh, we want to avoid green and impact washing. So make sure that when you invest, uh, for example, in funds, look for those that actually do adopt very robust impact measurement and management systems so that we know that they are in fact delivering impact and also hopefully alongside the re financial return. Michael. I think uh, one of the big challenges is knowledge and capability. Mm -hmm. I think um, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, I, bringing a lens of impact investing, social return, to how you look at things fundamentally can change how you approach investments. So that's probably first and foremost. And secondly, knowing where to focus and knowing where you can add value, you know. There is no shortage of opportunities out there, but really making sure you put a bit of time and effort to think not only where is important, but where can you add value beyond your pure funds. So it might be your organisational footprint, your connections, your supply chains, the dynamics, the broader ecosystem of your organisations, your partners, your finance partners. Trying to find that sweet spot is where you can really have the biggest impact because, you know, time's not always on our side. Eric? Um, well, finding the right partners are very important. That's why we get deal flows all around the world. Um, and uh, I think uh, to have uh, some brave to jump into it and try, because uh, the world is changing every day um, and be limbo and be flexible because uh, some funds would have a you know, very, very fixed uh, thesis for like 10 years, but we actually change every year. So, um, so be, be very flexible and change with the world. Yeah, Andrew? I I'll go along uh, partnership because through that you get a quicker return, so-called return, to justify for you to move on. So I think having the challenge is finding the right partnership but I think that's also the opportunity to do something with more impact. If I can start with uh, you, Andrew, for the last uh, rapid fire question. What's the next big issue that you as an impact investor want to address? Up in space. Space technology making a better world for us to live in. Eric? Yeah, is uh, space to us too? Because we already started uh, investing in space. Uh, we have two companies in Europe that tackle space debris, then can grab the debris, throw it back to Earth, and also like a Google map that even map the uh, small objects like a screw in, uh, in the space and avoid collision with uh, our spacecraft and uh, satellites, because so, uh, space is becoming very important to us. Yeah, space seems to be the next new frontier, huh? Oh, by the way, recently I had a dialogue with uh, one of the company that using 3D printing, 60 days they print a rocket, and they successfully launched, amazing. Michael? 
Uh, biggest challenge or opportunity, and I've heard a lot of language around risk and opportunity, it would have to be genuinely tapping into uh, the shared commitments that uh, our investors uh, and our tenants, uh, people in the community, our JV partners and so forth have set. And I really don't, I think we're only on the cusp of really genuinely tapping into that and accelerating things, as we mentioned, you know. The, um, so I think while that's a big challenge, it's quite an exciting one to have. Uh, looking forward to doing it. Food, because uh, 9 million people are still dying of hunger every year. Uh, every 10 seconds a child dies of hunger and the world population is set to soar to 10 billion by 2050. So if we don't harness technology to actually catalyze more sustainable food production and consumption patterns, we'll be in deep trouble. So hopefully we can really use um, technology, AI, IoT sensors, machine learning to um, really grow more food for our world. Thank you. Uh, perhaps now is the time to open the floor for any question. Any question? Okay, if not, Stephanie, <laughs> you have a question. Yeah, you know, um, oh, sorry. Um, we're a bit overrepresented here, but please bear with me, like with UBS. We're very passionate in this space. But so, actually, coming from the point of UBS, how do you, um, in your respective businesses and, in, and investments, uh, leverage your advisors to pursue impact investing? Like, have we been useful, hopefully? Michael? I'll jump in. <laughs> Look, I think it advisors are great to give an external perspective. I love seeing the organisation that I'm in benchmarked against local, international. I love seeing the organisation benchmarked against same sector, different sector. Um, uh, I think getting that external lens on the flows of capital, what the broader markets are doing, you know, my, my focus... I'm an environmental scientist. I don't come from a pure finance background. I've been in this industry 30 years. But getting those kind of intel and insights I find quite critical when I'm dealing with board members um, or if I'm um, discussing it with insurance partners or I'm talking to future investors. So I think getting that external pulse on things is actually really fundamental and quite critical. Um, uh, and, and as well as that, you know, it is helpful because... Uh, the way sustainable finance has gone, it is actually, it has moved quite into mainstream. So it is great to see that transition. So, you know, that's that in itself has been quite a powerful transformational tool internally in organisations, but also with regards to the kind of products and services that the organisation delivers. Pullman? Yeah, I just want to add that... Um, you know, knowledge obviously plays a very strong role in impact investing uh, investments. And um, I think, you know, in, in our collaboration with UBS, I have really seen the difference between top-notch <laughs> um, advisors and those who actually just are more opportunistic because those with the knowledge can actually help you find those opportunities that truly define, deliver impact. Um, in fact, I just want to do a bit of advertising here. I've founded a non-profit institute of sustainability and technology precisely because we feel that knowledge is so important. Um, I think in the past, ESG used to be a compliance. So a lot of people just, a lot of companies uh, outsource to other professionals. But now I think there's a lot more genuine interest in incorporating uh, sustainability at the core of your strategy. And that's when you really need to uh, kind of groom that in-house talent and develop that uh, expertise. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, for UBS, that's uh, one of the biggest uh, wealth managers because with the combined entity, we are talking about managing five trillion assets globally. And I truly believe that we have the corporate responsibility because we are so privileged to know where the wealth is and how we connect the wealth with the people with the needs. And so we even make the announcement, our purpose is Connecting the people to a better world, we imagine the, invest, the power of investing. So that's really our, our core kind of a belief and calling. Okay, with that, 
Thank you so much, um, all the uh, insights shared by the panelists, and look forward to hearing more from you on your impact investing journey not too long, huh? Soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, indeed. Thank you, Amy, Andrew, Eric, Michael, and Pullman for the really engaging discussion. Well, it has been a very constructive afternoon. So to run off our discussions, we are honored to have Celia Holmes in the CEO of EQT, EQT Foundation to share with us her insights on the future of impact investing in Asia to be moderated by Linda Rodos, which Chief Communication and Marketing uh, Officer. Chief, welcome to the stage. Thank you, King, for that nice introduction. And Celia, thank you so much for being here. Um, the Jin is a co-host in this uh, event, and we're very grateful to the FSDC for co-hosting it with us. Um, my name's Linda Radosevich, and I'm pleased to introduce Celia um, Holmes Indel, CEO of the EQT, excuse me, EQT Foundation, based in Stockholm, Sweden. Celia has a long history in the impact industry, starting with a double degree in sustainable innovation in international business. Prior to joining EQT, Indel was the CEO of impact investing organization Catapult and sustainability director at Acker, Acker Biomarine, a Norwegian fishing and biotech company. She also holds several board positions to help companies with sustainable transfer transformation. Let's give a welcoming round of applause to Celia. Thank you so much, Linda. And it's, it's great to be here. And I want to thank uh, the organizers of this event and everybody who took the time here. Is there um, anything I've uh, really felt in my body for the last, last, I think, five weeks. I've been traveling and visiting our eight offices. We have an office here in Hong Kong with around 100 employees in Negati, but visiting all our offices and really feeling the interest, the excitement, the panelists, eagerness of getting started with impact investing in this region. Uh, so it's really, with all of, like, feeling very humble of being here today, and feeling that there is so much effort in combining the knowledge in the world, in this space, I would say the dedication of this region. And I know when this region decides that they're gonna do something, it happens. Um, so I'm, I'm really honored to be here today and to be able uh, to take part and contribute into developing the field of impact investing in this region. Thank you, Celia. I think it'll be a lot of fun um, to take this more into, uh, take a personal note. Um, early in your career, you assisted the work of the permanent mission of Norway in development of the sustainable development goals, something that has been brought up quite a bit here today. Can you take us on a journey and describe what it was like to be on the team that negotiated the goals? and? Give us a glimpse of some of the day-to-day -day challenges and breakthrough moments you had um, during these negotiations. I think the biggest challenge of the negotiations of the SDGs was the feeling of deja vu. When you're weeks after weeks going into the same room to negotiate and the number of goals just starts increasing and you get to the 17. And I think uh, many countries were saying that we, we only wanted 10 goals. It would be much easier to communicate. But you kind of realize that in order to get a holistic map of all the challenges in the world, that all those 193 countries can agree to that are important, we needed the six thematical goals, and then we needed the seven one to stress that collaboration was so important. But I really feel that it was this returning time and time again and feeling, okay, are we done now? <laughs> uh, and I think the key challenge of that agenda is to understand that a nation has to adhere to all the goals and companies can be selective and use their research resources and strengths 
uh, in order to deliver on the goals and select a few of them. Or as we see today on the stage, the people in impact investing prioritize the theme and get really good at using their resources in solving that challenge with investing in solutions. Um, That's wonderful. I think if you can get all of the countries in the world to agree on 17 goals, um, anything's possible. Fast forward to, the, uh, to today and you're the CEO of EQT Foundation, uh, which houses the philanthropic activities of EQT, the private equity firm with 114 billion in euro in assets under management. Um, can you explain a little bit about the relationship between EQT and the foundation um, and the foundation's role in de-risking uh, investments for EQT? Sure. Uh, so EQT is a private markets firm. Uh, I think one of the biggest one globally and the first one that was launched after the big American firms. Uh, it is really uh, uh, invested in private equity, healthcare, infrastructure, but also real estate. Uh, and on the private equity side, we are also invested in ventures. And I think what we're doing through the EQT Foundation is to look at how can we use what we're good at as investors, but move into a whole new area of the investing market. So we're in catalytic capital. So it's kind of this pocket of money within impact investing where you go into areas and support breakthrough ideas where there's no track record. There's immense amounts of risk. Uh, and being there uh, to actually use our resources, take smaller tickets, but really support by having volunteers from all over EQT support the entrepreneurs so that we can de-risk them for other investors, other impact-oriented um, investors who wants to support some of these new solutions speci specifically into climate tech and health tech and equity. Uh, so, yeah. That's great. Can you give an example of an area that maybe the foundation went into, helped de-risk, and then EQT invested in afterwards, and also uh, speak to whether you co-invest or EQT will co-invest in these areas? So I think what we look at um, is to go in very, very early stage, all the way down to pre-seed seed, seed um, and de-risk it for all investors. So if we can support the entrepreneurs with capital from EQT, from our ventures fund or our growth funds later on. It just means that we have helped them through those barriers where any VC fund can also go in and, and support them. Um, we have uh, some of the, uh, the companies we have supported where we see a lot of traction uh, when they've made their proof points, uh, where there's interest both from our funds but also from other funds coming in. And I think one of those examples is green cement, for example. I think our link to the industrial and material sector and real estate, it's really important for us that new technology are surfacing. So it's for the entire sector that we're doing these investments. And I think on um, the climate tech side, we've invested in a startup that is bioengineering trees to grow 40% faster, delivering better quality timber, and also capturing more CO2 in the process. So we went in before they had proven their the theory that this was possible to do. But the moment you can help that type of company come through and prove and have valid points with their science so that they can attract more growth capital, that's kind of the beginning where we want to be. And I think we're a new type of foundation because we are at the core, we're a catalytic investor, and our grant bucket is supporting our investment strategy. Rather than we've heard a lot of examples where there's a grant program and then you move your endowment to also support the way you're having, you want to have impact in the world. And I think for this region, with so many strong family offices and foundation, we had to ask ourselves, starting this foundation just three years ago when EQT listed on the stock exchange, we had to ask ourselves, how can we give back the most effectively? What are we good at? And being a global investment firm, it was really about how can we use that investment expertise in an area where the entrepreneurs normally don't access that type of a skill set so that we're helping move more capital into those areas. And uh, our grand arm is then both supporting breakthrough science that have the promise of developing into companies, uh, but also the infrastructure and the field of impact investing. So obviously, 
enthusiastic supporters of, of the gin and of the research going into ensuring that we can make those proof points so that even more capital is coming into this direction. That's great. Both EQT and the foundation have been making increasing investments in Asia. You have a large office in Hong Kong and seven other um, cities in Asia. Why? What's going on? I, I would say it's, it's evident, right, what's going on. It's a very uh, fast-moving, very interesting region. I think we have a, a long history of, of being present here um, as EQT, and uh, out of the 119 um, billion asset under management, historically uh, 25 billion was deployed in this region. We've invested in 147 co uh, companies here. Um, I think it's, it's just fascinating, uh, the growth and the development here. I think one of our key lessons across the big private investors when you start looking into impact investing is that many of the sectors that you've naturally invested in have, they're already impactful. But when it comes back to impact investing, you didn't necessarily go into the investment with that intentionality. So I think it's also looking back and understanding that a lot of the investments that's already happening in this region into new technologies that are solving climate change or battery technology, or if it is in healthcare, might already be of the nature of giving you the expertise of moving into uh, impact investing. And then it's about working out your strategy and your investment thesis of going into these areas. Speaking of the enormous opportunity for impact investing in Asia, can you talk a little bit about the upcoming Impact Entrepreneur Challenge uh, that EQT will be hosting and um, kind of EQT's role in um, spurring entrepreneurs and investors through this challenge? So thank you. And I think, um, as I, I said, as in foundation, we're really supporting early stage entrepreneurs, but we're also doing it by leveraging all our employees across the globe to work with those entrepreneurs supporting them. So with 350 employees <laughs> across this region, I wanna invest in entrepreneurs that they can help support. So you guys have to help me, sending me the best, like really breakthrough ideas and entrepreneurs you know in this space, uh, because we're hosting a big entrepreneurship challenge in Hong Kong this fall and in Singapore and Southeast Asia in 2024. And we're also uh, doing some events in, in Korea and Japan too. So we're really here uh, to deploy capital for impact. Uh, and I need your help. Are you up for it? <laughs> I think so. I think so. Um, based on your 10 plus years in sustainable and impact investing, what are some myths that you would like to dispel uh, for investors who are just starting their journey to employ impact strategies? And I'm going to say we can skip the myth that you can't make uh, financial returns because I think we've covered that one well today. What are some other myths? Can I, can I stand up? I know we're late in the day, uh, but I want to make a clear distinction here. So if you compare me to a company, right? Historically, if I'm moving from A to B, I have to have a footprint. We call it the negative environment footprint today, right? Or social negative environment footprint. It's not the company's fault that they're having a footprint. It was how we designed it to start with. For a long time, CSR was about putting your hand somewhere and having a positive impact. But what happened was the companies were stomping around in one area and throwing money at a completely different area to compensate for the negative they were doing, to get a clear conscience. What is really exciting now is that we started to walk more lightly on the earth and on the societies in which we involve. So we reduce our negative footprint, but most importantly, we started putting our hands down the same place we were walking. And I think the really interesting part is when you integrate and now I say sustainability, not the impact, sustainability in the way you operate. You're improving your operations. 
so that you can stand on your hands. The hands is your impact. I can walk from A to B without moving my hands. When I put my hands, it's intentional. I know the impact I want to create with my hands. So sustainability is about the footprint and impact is about the handprint of what we want to leave behind after and so what we want to contribute with. It's going to be fully okay for a normal company to learn to stand still and not walk too hard on the earth and be compensating as long as they're not harming. But they're not gonna be an impact company. But they're gonna be a good company. But impact investing is really about investing in those solutions. And my second distinction that I wanna make cl <laughs> very clear is that you can choose when you go into impact investing if you want to have financial returns as you would expect in the market or superior where you have impact driving the return through kind of technologies, et cetera, or if you want to be concessionary. When we're investing from a foundation, we've decided that we want the financial return, but we want to be concessionary in a different way by adding a lot of support to the entrepreneurs because we do think that the more of us together that can prove that impact and financial returns go together, we will crowd in a lot more capital to the space and grow it, as we said today, from one trillion to three trillion. And I think that is where I'm coming from. And I loved it when Stephanie Chow said it, of like taking something that's heartfelt, but using our intellect, using our mind to understand how can we much or how can we as effective as possible crowd in and build the momentum here? If it's heartfelt, but you're throwing money at something that is not gonna grow or self-replicate, you're wasting that money in driving this change. And I think a lot of nonprofits, and they say it with foundations as well, you're just throwing spaghetti on the wall and hoping that it sticks, right? I think there's a huge opportunity here. And I, I will invite everyone who wants to talk about being a new type of a foundation in this region or family office deploying money uh, to come and, and connect with me because I think there's this immense opportunity of what can be done here because you have, we talked about it this earlier uh, in the green room of having so many nonprofits in this region, so much activity. What if that could be channeled and, and combined with impact investing? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't warn you about that. <laughs> that way, all the better. There's, there's the footprints we leave, the handprints that we intend to leave and the heartfeltness that pulls them together. So thank you very much for that. Um, wrapping up this incredible afternoon that we've had here today and all the amazing speakers and, and members of the audience, um, I would love to have you describe what you see from your vantage point as the future of impact investing in Asia and Hong Kong's role in enabling it? I think my call to action would be for you to prove that we can bring the awareness and the understanding and the deployment of capital up to speed to the other regions that we saw up on this map way faster than any one of the others did without all the back and forth of what is ESG and what is impact investing, of just being clear about definitions and saying, I have this type of capital and I'm gonna go there and deploy it. Because I'm, I hope, and I hope to spend a lot more time here investing in, in entrepreneurs and supporting you guys and, and building the momentum here. But I really do believe uh, that this region can take a leadership position on impact investing. It's hard to top that, and so we're going to take this opportunity to give back the gift of a couple of minutes um, to the room. Uh, Celia, thank you so much. 
I'm gonna hand off the microphone to my colleague, Dean Hand, uh, the Chief Research Officer at the GIN for a couple of closing remarks. And thank you, Celia. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for your patience as the stage is reset. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be able to share with you some closing remarks. And I, I must admit, um, the, the hand and the footprint is pretty hard to follow at this point, so I'll be brief. Um, I'm sure that you will agree with me that it's been a particularly productive and insightful afternoon. Um, I still do want to share a couple of key thoughts that I hope that you've heard today um, and that you consider how you're going to build into your work going forward. And I say that with some seriousness because I do think that this is a serious moment in the world. Um, firstly, I think that it's really clear that there are enormous opportunities here to generate both financial returns and positive impact especially in the Asian region and specifically Hong Kong. Um, we've heard a number of speakers today speak about the very specific opportunities that they see, and that is certainly heartwarming. Um, assets being allocated to impact investing in the region are growing, and personally, I don't think that that trajectory um, is about to change. I have the privilege and honor of seeing some of the analysis that we're doing at the moment that I can't really talk about until the summer, um, but the, 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 certainly the opportunities and the assets are looking pretty good. Um, impact investing is a serious and viable investing strategy. Sure, there are challenges and certainly people have spoken about them, um, but it can contribute to addressing the solutions that, um, and the issues that vex us um, in our planet and our world today. Um, like building a more sustainable world, which is something that we aspire to enormously. The question really is how. How you take advantage of the opportunities that it offers and how do you start quickly and at scale in the markets that really matter. We've heard a lot about today about just getting started and I think that that's an important message is start somewhere. It's really important. Start by defining your impact goals, um, whether it's a specific sector like clean energy or financial inclusion or across your portfolio through a particular asset class, or whether it's um, something that your family office or foundation may consider to align your investment strategy with your mission, just start. And with that, I especially want to thank our partners today for this convening. Um, it's the Financial Services Development Council um, of Hong Kong. It's been such a pleasure to work with you. Most importantly, I really want to thank you um, our audience. Um, you've been fantastic and it's always wonderful to see at this late stage um, how many people stay in the room and we find that particularly important and, and I'm really glad that you're here. I know that you're looking forward to meeting up with many of the speakers that you've heard this afternoon so I won't hold you back any further and please join us for cocktails and give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.